The Spirit Level Why Greater Equality Makes Societies Stronger by Richard Wilkinson and Kate Pickett Narrated by Clive Chafer Copyright 2009 by Richard Wilkinson and Kate Pickett Forward Copyright 2010 by Robert B. Reich This unabridged audiobook is published by arrangement with Bloomsbury USA and was produced in the year 2011 by Tantor Media Incorporated, which holds the copyright there too. This audiobook is packaged with bonus material, which has been included on each audio and MP3 CD. If you downloaded this audiobook in a digital format, please refer to www.tantor.com keyword spirit level and click on PDF Extra to access these images. Forward. Robert B. Reich, Professor of Public Policy, University of California, former U.S. Secretary of Labor. Most American families are worse off today than they were three decades ago. The Great Recession of 2008-2009 destroyed the value of their homes, undermined their savings, and too often left them without jobs. But even before the Great Recession began, most Americans had gained little from the economic expansion that began almost three decades before. Today, the Great Recession notwithstanding, the U.S. economy is far larger than it was in 1980. But where has all the wealth gone? Mostly to the very top. The latest data shows that by 2007, America's top 1% of earners received 23% of the nation's total income, almost triple their 8% share in 1980. This rapid trend toward inequality in America marks a significant reversal of the move toward income equality that began in the early part of the 20th century and culminated during the middle decades of the century. Yet inequality has not loomed large as a political issue. Even Barack Obama's modest proposal to return income tax rates to where they stood in the 1990s prompted his 2008 Republican opponents to call him a socialist who wanted to spread the wealth. Once president, Obama's even more modest proposal to limit the income tax deductions of the wealthy in order to pay for health care for all met fierce resistance from a democratically controlled Congress. If politicians have failed to grapple with the issue of inequality, few scholars have done better. Philosophers have had little to say on the subject. Some who would tax the rich to help the poor frame their arguments as utilitarian. Taking a hundred dollars from a rich person and giving it to a poor person would diminish the rich person's happiness only slightly, they argue, but greatly increase the happiness of the poor person. Others ground their arguments in terms of hypothetical consent. John Rawls defends redistribution on the grounds that most people would be in favor of it if they had no idea what their income would otherwise be. Nor have economists, whom we might expect to focus attention on such a dramatic trend, expressed much concern about widening inequality. For the most part, economists concern themselves with efficiency and growth. In fact, some of them argue that wide inequality is a necessary, if not inevitable, consequence of a growing economy. A few worry that it cuts off opportunities among the children of the poor for productive lives, but whether to distribute wealth more equally, or what might be gained from doing so, is a topic all but ignored by today's economic researchers. It has taken two experts from the field of public health to deliver a major study of the effects of inequality on society. Though Richard Wilkinson and Kate Pickett are British, their research explores the United States in depth, and their work is an important contribution to the debate our country needs. The Spirit Level looks at the negative social effects of wide inequality, among them more physical and mental illness not only among those at the lower ranks but even those at the top of the scale. The authors find, not surprisingly, that where there are great disparities in wealth, there are heightened levels of social distrust. They argue convincingly that wide inequality is bad for a society and that more equal societies tend to do better on many measures of social health and wealth. But if wide inequality is socially dysfunctional, then why are certain countries, such as the United States, becoming so unequal? 
largely because of the increasing gains to be had by being just a bit better than other competitors in a system becoming ever more competitive. Consider executive pay. During the 1950s and 60s, CEOs of major American companies took home about 25 to 30 times the wages of the typical worker. After the 1970s, the two pay scales diverged. In 1980, the big company CEO took home roughly 40 times. By 1990, it was 100 times. By 2007, just before the Great Recession, CEO pay packages had ballooned to about 350 times what the typical worker earned. Recent supports suggest that the upward trajectory of executive pay, temporarily stopped by the economic meltdown, is on the verge of continuing. To make the comparison especially vivid, in 1968 the CEO of General Motors, then the largest company in the United States, took home around 66 times the pay and benefits of the typical GM worker at the time. In 2005, the CEO of Walmart, by then the largest US company, took home 900 times the pay and benefits of the typical Walmart worker. What explains this trajectory? Have top executives become greedier? Have corporate boards grown less responsible? Are CEOs more crooked? Are investors more docile? Is Wall Street more tractable? There's no evidence to support any of these theories. Here's a simpler explanation. Forty years ago, everyone's pay in a big company, even pay at the top, was affected by bargains struck among big business, big labor, and indirectly government. Big companies and their unions directly negotiated pay scales for hourly workers, while white-collar workers understood that their pay grades were indirectly affected. Large corporations resembled civil service bureaucracies. Top executives in these huge companies had to maintain the goodwill of organized labor. They also had to maintain good relationships with public officials in order to be free to set wages and prices, to obtain regulatory permissions on fares, rates or licenses, and to continue to secure government contracts. It would have been unseemly of them to draw very high salaries. Since then, competition has intensified. With ever greater ease, rival companies can get access to similar low-cost suppliers from all over the world. They can streamline their operations with the same information technology their competitors use. They can cut their labor force and substitute similar software culled from many of the same vendors. They can just as readily outsource hourly jobs abroad. They can get capital for new investment on much the same terms. They can gain access to distribution channels that are no less efficient, some of them even identical, Walmart or other big-box retailers. They can attract shareholders by showing even slightly better performance or the promise of it. The dilemma facing so many companies is therefore how to beat rivals. Even a small advantage can make a huge difference to the bottom line. In economic terms, CEOs have become less like top bureaucrats and more like Hollywood celebrities or star athletes who take a share of the house. Hollywood's most popular celebrities now pull in around 15% of whatever the studios take in at the box office, and athletes are also getting a growing portion of sales. As the New Yorker's James Surowiecki has reminded us, Mickey Mantle earned $60,000 in 1957, Carlos Beltran made $15 million in 2005. Even adjusting for inflation, Beltran got 40 times as much as Mantle. Clark Gable earned $100,000 a picture in the 1940s, which translates into roughly $800,000 today. Tom Hanks, by contrast, makes closer to $20 million per film. Movie studios and baseball teams find it profitable to pay these breathtaking sums, because they're still relatively small compared to the money these stars bring in and the profits they generate. Today's big companies are paying their CEOs mammoth sums for much the same reason. In the world of finance, the numbers are yet greater. Top investment bankers and traders take home even more than CEOs or most Hollywood stars. For the managers of 26 major hedge funds, the average take-home pay in 2005 was $363 million, a 45% increase over their average earnings the year before. 
The Wall Street meltdown took its toll on some of these hedge funds and their managers, but by the end of 2009, many were back. This economic explanation for these startling levels of pay does not justify them socially or morally. It only means that in our roles as consumers and investors, we implicitly think CEOs, star athletes and Hollywood celebrities are worth it. As citizens, though, most of us disapprove. Polls continue to show that a great majority of Americans believe CEOs are overpaid and that inequality of income and wealth is a large problem. In short, our nation's wealth is becoming even more concentrated at the top. It has become the financial equivalent of hydrodynamics. Large streams of income create even larger pools of wealth. The family of Walmart founder Sam Walton has a combined fortune estimated to be about $90 billion. In 2005, Bill Gates was worth $46 billion, Warren Buffett $44 billion. By contrast, the combined wealth of the bottom 40% of the United States population that year, some 120 million people, was estimated to be around $95 billion. Here again, the Great Recession of 2008 to 2009 took a toll. Some of these billionaires' fortunes were whittled down by 20 to 40%, but even then, they remained immense. As citizens, we may feel that inequality on this scale cannot possibly be good for us, and Wilkinson and Pickett supply the evidence that confirms our gut sense of unease. Such inequality undermines the trust, solidarity and mutuality on which responsibilities of citizenship depend. It creates a new aristocracy whose privileges perpetuate themselves over generations. One of the striking findings in these pages is that America now has less social mobility than many poorer countries, and it breeds cynicism among the rest of us. This is not to say that the super-rich are at fault. By and large, the market is generating these outlandish results. But the market is a creation of public policies, and public policies, as the authors make clear, can reorganize the market to reverse these trends. The spirit level shows why the effort to do so is a vital one for the health of our society. Berkeley, California, July 2009 Preface People usually exaggerate the importance of their own work, and we worry about claiming too much. But this book is not just another set of nostrums and prejudices about how to put the world to rights. The work we describe here comes out of a very long period of research, over 50-person years between us, devoted initially to trying to understand the causes of the big differences in life expectancy, the health inequalities, between people at different levels in the social hierarchy in modern societies. The focal problem initially was to understand why health gets worse at every step down the social ladder, so that the poor are less healthy than those in the middle, who in turn are less healthy than those further up. Like others who work on the social determinants of health, our training in epidemiology means that our methods are those used to trace the causes of diseases in populations, trying to find out why one group of people gets a particular disease while another group doesn't, or to explain why some disease is becoming more common. The same methods can, however, also be used to understand the causes of other kinds of problems, not just health. Just as the term evidence-based medicine is used to describe current efforts to ensure that medical treatment is based on the best scientific evidence of what works and what does not, we thought of calling this book Evidence-Based Politics. The research which underpins what we describe comes from a great many research teams in different universities and research organizations. Replicable methods have been used to study observable and objective outcomes, and peer-reviewed research reports have been published in academic scientific journals. This does not mean that there is no guesswork. Results always have to be interpreted, but there are usually good reasons for favoring one interpretation over another. Initial theories and expectations are often called into question by later research findings which make it necessary to think again. We would like to take you on the journey we have travelled, 
signposted by crucial bits of evidence and leaving out only the various cul-de-sacs and wrong turnings that wasted so much time to arrive at a better understanding of how we believe it is possible to improve the quality of life for everyone in modern societies. We shall set out the evidence and our reasons for interpreting it the way we do so that you can judge for yourself. At an intuitive level, people have always recognized that inequality is socially corrosive, but there seemed little reason to think that levels of inequality in developed societies differed enough to expect any measurable effects. The reasons which first led one of us to look for effects seem now largely irrelevant to the striking picture which has emerged. Many discoveries owe as much to luck as judgment. The reason why the picture we present has not been put together until now is probably that much of the data has only become available in recent years. With internationally comparable information not only on incomes and income distribution, but also on different health and social problems, it could only have been a matter of time before someone came up with findings like ours. The emerging data have allowed us and other researchers to analyze how societies differ, to discover how one factor is related to another, and to test theories more rigorously. It is easy to imagine that discoveries are more rapidly accepted in the natural than in the social sciences, as if physical theories are somehow less controversial than theories about the social world. But the history of the natural sciences is littered with painful personal disputes which started off as theoretical disagreements but often lasted for the rest of people's lives. Controversies in the natural sciences are usually confined to the experts. Most people do not have strong views on rival theories in particle physics, but they do have views on how society works. Social theories are partly theories about ourselves, Indeed, they might almost be regarded as part of our self-awareness or self-consciousness of societies. While natural scientists do not have to convince individual cells or atoms to accept their theories, social theorists are up against a plethora of individual views and powerful vested interests. In 1847, Ignaz Semmelweis discovered that if doctors washed their hands before attending women in childbirth, it dramatically reduced deaths from puerperal fever but before his work could have much benefit, he had to persuade people, principally his medical colleagues, to change their behavior. His real battle was not his initial discovery, but what followed from it. His views were ridiculed, and he was driven eventually to insanity and suicide. Much of the medical profession did not take his work seriously until Louis Pasteur and Joseph Lister had developed the germ theory of disease, which explained why hygiene was important. We live in a pessimistic period. As well as being worried by the likely consequences of global warming, it is easy to feel that many societies are, despite their material success, increasingly burdened by their social failings. If correct, the theory and evidence set out in this book tells us how to make substantial improvements in the quality of life for the vast majority of the population. Yet unless it is possible to change the way most people see the societies they live in, the theory will be stillborn. Public opinion will only support the necessary political changes if something like the perspective we outline in this book permeates the public mind. We have therefore set up a not-for-profit trust to try to make the kind of evidence set out in the following audiobook better known. Lacking funds and expertise, it is, at the time of writing, scarcely more than a website www.equalitytrust.org.uk But we hope at least to suggest that there is a way out of the woods for us all. Note on Graphs Facts from Figures How to Look at the Graphs in this book Most of the graphs that we use in this book are charts linking income equality to different health and social problems. They show relationships either 1. internationally, comparing rich countries, or 2. in the USA, comparing different states. In all of these graphs, we put income equality along the horizontal line at the bottom, the x-axis, so societies with low levels of inequality are to the left, and societies with high levels of inequality are towards the right of the graph. The different health and social outcomes are shown on the vertical line, the y-axis, on the left side of the graph. 
On most of the graphs there are two features. First there is a scatter of points, either of rich countries or of US states, so that listeners can see exactly how each society compares to others. Second, there is a line called a regression line, which shows the best fit relationship between income inequality and the outcome on that graph. This line is not chosen by us, but is calculated by statistical software to give the line which best fits the trend through the data points. It is also possible to calculate how unlikely it is that the pattern we see could result from chance alone. We have only included a best fit line through the points if the relationship would be very unlikely to occur by chance. When a graph has no best fit line, it means that there is no evidence of a relationship. If the line slopes steeply upwards from left to right, it shows that the health or social outcome becomes more common in more unequal societies. This pattern tends to occur with problems that we think of as bad, such as violence. If the line slopes steeply downwards from left to right, it shows that the health or social outcome is much less common in more unequal societies. We see this pattern for things that we think of as good, such as trust. A wider scatter of points on the graph means that there are other important influences on the outcome. It may not mean that inequality is not a powerful influence, simply that other factors matter as well. A narrow scattering of points means that there is a very close relationship between inequality and the outcome, and that inequality is an excellent predictor of the outcome. Further details of our methods can be found at www.equalitytrust.org.uk Part 1. Material Success, Social Failure 1. The End of an Era Quote, I care for riches to make gifts to friends, or lead a sick man back to health with ease and plenty. Else small aid is wealth for daily gladness. Once a man be done with hunger, rich and poor are all as one. Unquote. Euripides, Electra. It is a remarkable paradox that at the pinnacle of human material and technical achievement, we find ourselves anxiety-ridden, prone to depression, worried about how others see us, unsure of our friendships, driven to consume, and with little or no community life. Lacking the relaxed social contact and emotional satisfaction we all need, we seek comfort in overeating, obsessive shopping and spending, or become prey to excessive alcohol, psychoactive medicines and illegal drugs. How is it that we have created so much mental and emotional suffering, despite levels of wealth and comfort unprecedented in human history? Often what we feel is missing is little more than time enjoying the company of friends, yet even that can seem beyond us. We talk as if our lives were a constant battle for psychological survival, struggling against stress and emotional exhaustion, but the truth is that the luxury and extravagance of our lives is so great that it threatens the planet. Research from the Harvard Institute for Public Innovation, commissioned by the Merck Family Foundation in the USA, shows that people feel that materialism somehow comes between them and the satisfaction of their social needs. A report entitled Yearning for Balance, based on a nationwide survey of Americans, concluded that they were, quote, deeply ambivalent about wealth and material gain, unquote. A large majority of people wanted society to, quote, move away from greed and excess toward a way of life more centered on values, community, and family, unquote. But they also felt that these priorities were not shared by most of their fellow Americans, who they believed had become, quote, increasingly atomized, selfish, and irresponsible, unquote. As a result, they often felt isolated. However, the report says that when brought together in focus groups to discuss these issues, people were, quote, surprised and excited to find that others shared their views, unquote. Rather than uniting us with others in a common cause, the unease we feel about the loss of social values and the way we are drawn into the pursuit of material gain is often experienced as if it were a purely private ambivalence which cuts us off from others. 
mainstream politics no longer taps into these issues and has abandoned the attempt to provide a shared vision capable of inspiring us to create a better society. As voters, we have lost sight of any collective belief that society could be different. Instead of a better society, the only thing almost everyone strives for is to better their own position as individuals within the existing society. The contrast between the material success and social failure of many rich countries is an important signpost. It suggests that, if we are to gain further improvements in the real quality of life, we need to shift attention from material standards and economic growth to ways of improving the psychological and social well-being of whole societies. However, as soon as anything psychological is mentioned, discussion tends to focus almost exclusively on individual remedies and treatments. Political thinking seems to run into the sand. It is now possible to piece together a new, compelling and coherent picture of how we can release societies from the grip of so much dysfunctional behaviour. A proper understanding of what is going on could transform politics and the quality of life for all of us. It would change our experience of the world around us, change what we vote for, and change what we demand from our politicians. In this book, we show that the quality of social relations in a society is built on material foundations. The scale of income differences has a powerful effect on how we relate to each other. Rather than blaming parents, religion, values, education or the penal system, we will show that the scale of inequality provides a powerful policy lever on the psychological well-being of all of us. Just as it once took studies of weight gain in babies to show that interacting with a loving caregiver is crucial to child development, so it has taken studies of death rates and of income distribution to show the social needs of adults and to demonstrate how societies can meet them. Long before the financial crisis which gathered pace in the later part of 2008, British politicians commenting on the decline of community or the rise of various forms of antisocial behaviour would sometimes refer to our broken society. The financial collapse shifted attention to the broken economy, and while the broken society was sometimes blamed on the behaviour of the poor, the broken economy was widely attributed to the rich. Stimulated by the prospects of ever bigger salaries and bonuses, those in charge of some of the most trusted financial institutions threw caution to the wind and built houses of cards which could stand only within the protection of a thin speculative bubble. But the truth is that both the broken society and the broken economy resulted from the growth of inequality. Where the Evidence Leads we shall start by outlining the evidence which shows that we have got close to the end of what economic growth can do for us. For thousands of years, the best way of improving the quality of human life was to raise material living standards. When the wolf was never far from the door, good times were simply times of plenty. But for the vast majority of people in affluent countries, the difficulties of life are no longer about filling our stomachs, having clean water and keeping warm. Most of us now wish we could eat less rather than more, and for the first time in history the poor are, on average, fatter than the rich. Economic growth, for so long the great engine of progress, has in the rich countries largely finished its work. Not only have measures of well-being and happiness ceased to rise with economic growth, but as affluent societies have grown richer, there have been long-term rises in rates of anxiety, depression, and numerous other social problems. The populations of rich countries have got to the end of a long historical journey. The course of the journey we have made can be seen in Figure 1.1. It shows the trends in life expectancy in relation to gross national income per head in countries at various stages of economic development. Among poorer countries, life expectancy increases rapidly during the early stages of economic development, but then, starting among the middle-income countries, the rate of improvement slows down. As living standards rise and countries get richer and richer, the relationship between economic growth and life expectancy weakens. 
Eventually, it disappears entirely, and the rising curve in figure 1.1 becomes horizontal, showing that for rich countries to get richer adds nothing further to their life expectancy. That has already happened in the richest 30 or so countries nearest the top right-hand corner of figure 1.1. The reason why the curve in figure 1.1 levels out is not because we have reached the limits of life expectancy. Even the richest countries go on enjoying substantial improvements in health as time goes by. What has changed is that the improvements have ceased to be related to average living standards. With every 10 years that passes, life expectancy among the rich countries increases by between 2 and 3 years. This happens regardless of economic growth so that a country as rich as the USA no longer does better than Greece or New Zealand, although they are not much more than half as rich. Rather than moving out along the curve in figure 1.1, what happens as time goes by is that the curve shifts upwards. The same levels of income are associated with higher life expectancy. Looking at the data, you cannot help but conclude that as countries get richer, further increases in average living standards do less and less for health. While good health and longevity are important, there are other components of the quality of life. But just as the relationship between health and economic growth has leveled off, so too has the relationship with happiness. Like health, how happy people are rises in the early stages of economic growth and then levels off. This is a point made strongly by the economist Richard Layard in his book on happiness. Figures on happiness in different countries are probably strongly affected by culture. In some societies, not saying you are happy may sound like an admission of failure, while in another, claiming to be happy may sound self-satisfied and smug. But despite the difficulties, figure 1.2 shows the happiness curve leveling off in the richest countries in much the same way as life expectancy. In both cases, the important gains are made in the early stages of economic growth, but the richer a country gets, the less getting still richer adds to the population's happiness. In these graphs, the curves for both happiness and life expectancy flatten off at around $25,000 per capita, but there is some evidence that the income level at which this occurs may rise over time. The evidence that happiness levels fail to rise further as rich countries get still richer does not come only from comparisons of different countries at a single point in time, as shown in figure 1.2. In a few countries, such as Japan, the USA and Britain, it is possible to look at changes in happiness over sufficiently long periods of time to see whether they rise as a country gets richer. The evidence shows that happiness has not increased even over periods long enough for real incomes to have doubled. The same pattern has also been found by researchers using other indicators of well-being, such as the measure of economic welfare or the genuine progress indicator, which try to calculate net benefits of growth after removing costs like traffic congestion and pollution. So whether we look at health, happiness or other measures of well-being, there is a consistent picture. In poorer countries, economic development continues to be very important for human well-being. Increases in their material living standards result in substantial improvements both in objective measures of well-being like life expectancy and in subjective ones like happiness. But as nations join the ranks of the affluent developed countries, further rises in income count for less and less. This is a predictable pattern. As you get more and more of anything, each addition to what you have, whether loaves of bread or cars, contributes less and less to your well-being. If you are hungry, a loaf of bread is everything, but when your hunger is satisfied, many more loaves don't particularly help you and might become a nuisance as they go stale. Sooner or later in the long history of economic growth, countries inevitably reach a level of affluence where diminishing returns set in, and additional income buys less and less additional health, happiness or well-being. A number of developed countries have now had almost continuous rises in average incomes for over 150 years, and additional wealth is not as beneficial as it once was. The trends in different causes of death confirm this interpretation. It is the diseases of poverty which first decline as countries start to get richer. 
the great infectious diseases such as tuberculosis, cholera, or measles, which are still common in the poorest countries today, gradually cease to be the most important causes of death. As they disappear, we are left with the so-called diseases of affluence, the degenerative cardiovascular diseases and cancers. While the infectious diseases of poverty are particularly common in childhood and frequently kill even in the prime of life, the diseases of affluence are very largely diseases of later life. One other piece of evidence confirms that the reason why the curves in figures 1.1 and 1.2 level off is because countries have reached a threshold of material living standards after which the benefits of further economic growth are less substantial. It is that the diseases which used to be called the diseases of affluence became the diseases of the poor in affluent societies. Diseases like heart disease, stroke and obesity used to be more common among the rich. Heart disease was regarded as a businessman's disease, and it used to be the rich who were fat and the poor who were thin. But from about the 1950s onwards, in one developed country after another, these patterns reversed. Diseases which had been most common among the better off in each society reversed their social distribution to become more common among the poor. The Environmental Limits to Growth at the same time as the rich countries reach the end of the real benefits of economic growth, we have also had to recognize the problems of global warming and the environmental limits to growth. The dramatic reductions in carbon emissions needed to prevent runaway climate change and rises in sea levels may mean that even present levels of consumption are unsustainable, particularly if living standards in the poorer developing world are to rise as they need to. In Chapter 15, we shall discuss the ways in which the perspective outlined in this book fits in with policies designed to reduce global warming. Income Differences Within and Between Societies We are the first generation to have to find new answers to the question of how we can make further improvements to the real quality of human life. What should we turn to if not to economic growth? One of the most powerful clues to the answer to this question comes from the fact that we are affected very differently by the income differences within our own society from the way we are affected by the differences in average income between one rich society and another. In chapters 4 through 12, we focus on a series of health and social problems like violence, mental illness, teenage births and educational failure, which within each country are all more common among the poor than the rich. As a result, it often looks as if the effect of higher incomes and living standards is to lift people out of these problems. However, when we make comparisons between different societies, we find that these social problems have little or no relation to levels of average incomes in a society. Take health as an example. Instead of looking at life expectancy across both rich and poor countries, as in Figure 1.1, look just at the richest countries. Figure 1.3 shows just the rich countries and confirms that among them some countries can be almost twice as rich as others without any benefit to life expectancy. Yet within any of them, death rates are closely and systematically related to income. Figure 1.4 shows the relation between death rates and income levels within the USA. The death rates are for people in zip code areas classified by the typical household income of the area in which they live. On the right are the richer zip code areas with lower death rates, and on the left are the poorer ones with higher death rates. Although we use American data to illustrate this, similar health gradients of varying steepness run across almost every society. Higher incomes are related to lower death rates at every level in society. Note that this is not simply a matter of the poor having worse health than everyone else. What is so striking about figure 1.4 is how regular the health gradient is right across society. It is a gradient which affects us all. Within each country, people's health and happiness are related to their incomes. Richer people tend on average to be healthier and happier than poorer people in the same society. But comparing rich countries, it makes no difference whether on average people in one society are almost twice as rich as people in another. What sense can we make of this paradox? 
that differences in average income or living standards between whole populations or countries don't matter at all, but income differences within those same populations matter very much indeed. There are two plausible explanations. One is that what matters in rich countries may not be your actual income level and living standard, but how you compare with other people in the same society. Perhaps average standards don't matter, and what does is simply whether you are doing better or worse than other people, where you come in the social pecking order. The other possibility is that the social gradient in health shown in figure 1.4 results not from the effects of relative income or social status on health, but from the effects of social mobility, sorting the healthy from the unhealthy. Perhaps the healthy tend to move up the social ladder and the unhealthy end up at the bottom. This issue will be resolved in the next chapter. We shall see whether compressing or stretching out the income differences in a society matters. Do more and less equal societies suffer the same overall burden of health and social problems? 2. Poverty or Inequality Quote, Poverty is not a certain small amount of goods, nor is it just a relation between means and ends. Above all, it is a relation between people. Poverty is a social status. It has grown as an invidious distinction between classes. Unquote. Marshall Salins, Stone Age Economics. How much inequality? In the last chapter, we saw that economic growth and increases in average incomes have ceased to contribute much to well-being in the rich countries. But we also saw that within societies, health and social problems remain strongly associated with incomes. In this chapter, we will see whether the amount of income inequality in a society makes any difference. Figure 2.1 shows how the size of income differences varies from one developed country to another. At the top are the most equal countries, and at the bottom are the most unequal. The length of the horizontal bars shows how much richer the richest 20% of the population is in each country compared to the poorest 20%. Within countries such as Japan and some of the Scandinavian countries at the top of the chart, the richest 20% are less than four times as rich as the poorest 20%. At the bottom of the chart are countries in which these differences are at least twice as big, including two in which the richest 20% get about nine times as much as the poorest. Among the most unequal are Singapore, USA, Portugal and the United Kingdom. The figures are for household income after taxes and benefits, adjusted for the number of people in each household. There are lots of ways of measuring income inequality, and they are all so closely related to each other that it doesn't usually make much difference which you use. Instead of the top and bottom 20%, we could compare the top and bottom 10 or 30%, or we could have looked at the proportion of all incomes which go to the poorer half of the population. Typically, the poorest half of the population gets something like 20 or 25 percent of all incomes, and the richest half get the remaining 75 or 80 percent. Other more sophisticated measures include one called the Gini coefficient. It measures inequality across the whole society rather than simply comparing the extremes. If all income went to one person, maximum inequality, and everyone else got nothing, the Gini coefficient would be equal to 1. If income was shared equally and everyone got exactly the same, perfect equality, the Gini would equal 0. The lower its value, the more equal a society is. The most common values tend to be between 0 0.3 and 0 0.5, Another measure of inequality is called the Robin Hood Index because it tells you what proportion of a society's income would have to be taken from the rich and given to the poor to get complete equality. To avoid being accused of picking and choosing our measures, our approach in this book has been to take measures provided by official agencies rather than calculating our own. We use the ratio of the income received by the top to the bottom 20% whenever we are comparing inequality in different countries. It is easy to understand, and it is one of the measures provided ready-made by the United Nations. When comparing inequality in U.S. states, we use the Gini coefficient. It is the most common measure. 
it is favored by economists, and it is available from the U.S. Census Bureau. In many academic research papers, we and others have used two different inequality measures in order to show that the choice of measures rarely has a significant effect on results. Does the amount of inequality make a difference? Having got to the end of what economic growth can do for the quality of life and facing the problems of environmental damage, what difference do the inequalities shown in Figure 2.1 make? It has been known for some years that poor health and violence are more common in more unequal societies. However, in the course of our research, we became aware that almost all problems which are more common at the bottom of the social ladder are more common in more unequal societies. It is not just ill health and violence, but also, as we will show in later chapters, a host of other social problems. Almost all of them contribute to the widespread concern that modern societies are, despite their affluence, social failures. To see whether these problems were more common in more unequal countries, we collected internationally comparable data on health and as many social problems as we could find reliable figures for. The list we ended up with included Level of trust Mental illness, including drug and alcohol addiction Life expectancy and infant mortality Obesity Children's educational performance Teenage births Homicides Imprisonment rates Social mobility, not available for U.S. states Occasionally, what appear to be relationships between different things may arise spuriously or by chance. In order to be confident that our findings were sound, we also collected data for the same health and social problems, or as near as we could get to the same, for each of the 50 states of the USA. This allowed us to check whether or not problems were consistently related to inequality in these two independent settings. As Lyndon Johnson said, quote, America is not merely a nation, but a nation of nations, unquote. To present the overall picture, we have combined all the health and social problem data for each country and separately for each U.S. state to form an index of health and social problems for each country and U.S. state. Each item in the indexes carries the same weight, so, for example, the score for mental health has as much influence on a society's overall score as the homicide rate or the teenage birth rate. The result is an index showing how common all these health and social problems are in each country and each U.S. state. Things such as life expectancy are reverse scored, so that on every measure, higher scores reflect worse outcomes. When looking at the figures, the higher the score on the index of health and social problems, the worse things are. We start by showing in Figure 2.2 that there is a very strong tendency for ill health and social problems to occur less frequently in the more equal countries. With increasing inequality, to the right on the horizontal axis, the higher is the score on our index of health and social problems. Health and social problems are indeed more common in countries with bigger income inequalities. The two are extraordinarily closely related. Chance alone would almost never produce a scatter in which countries lined up like this. To emphasize that the prevalence of poor health and social problems in whole societies really is related to inequality rather than to average living standards, we show in Figure 2.3 the same index of health and social problems, but this time in relation to average incomes, national income per person. It shows that there is no similarly clear trend toward better outcomes in richer countries, this confirms what we saw in figures 1.1 and 1.2 in the first chapter. However, as well as knowing that health and social problems are more common among the less well-off within each society, as shown in figure 1.4, we now know that the overall burden of these problems is much higher in more unequal societies. To check whether these results are not just some odd fluke, let us see whether similar patterns also occur when we look at the 50 states of the USA. We were able to find data on almost exactly the same health and social problems for US states as we used in our international index. 
Figure 2.4 shows that the index of health and social problems is strongly related to the amount of inequality in each state, while Figure 2.5 shows that there is no clear relation between it and average income levels. The evidence from the USA confirms the international picture. The position of the US in the international graph, Figure 2.2, shows that the high average income level in the U.S. as a whole does nothing to reduce its health and social problems relative to other countries. We should note that part of the reason why our index combining data for 10 different health and social problems is so closely related to inequality is that combining them tends to emphasize what they have in common and downplays what they do not. In chapters 4 to 12, we will examine whether each problem taken on its own is related to inequality and will discuss the various reasons why they might be caused by inequality. This evidence cannot be dismissed as some statistical trick done with smoke and mirrors. What the close fit shown in Figure 2.2 suggests is that a common element related to the prevalence of all these health and social problems is indeed the amount of inequality in each country. All the data come from the most reputable sources, from the World Bank, the World Health Organization, the United Nations, and the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD, and others. Could these relationships be the result of some unrepresentative selection of problems? To answer this, we also used the Index of Child Well-Being in Rich Countries, compiled by the United Nations Children's Fund, UNICEF. It combines 40 different indicators covering many different aspects of child well-being. We removed the measure of child relative poverty from it because it is by definition closely related to inequality. Figure 2.6 shows that child well-being is strongly related to inequality and Figure 2.7 shows that it is not at all related to average income in each country. Social Gradients as we mentioned at the end of the last chapter, there are perhaps two widespread assumptions as to why people nearer the bottom of society suffer more problems. Either the circumstances people live in cause their problems, or people end up nearer the bottom of society because they are prone to problems which drag them down. The evidence we have seen in this chapter puts these issues in a new light. Let's first consider the view that society is a great sorting system, with people moving up or down the social ladder according to their personal characteristics and vulnerabilities. While things such as having poor health, doing badly at school, or having a baby when still a teenager all load the dice against your chances of getting up the social ladder, sorting alone does nothing to explain why more unequal societies have more of all these problems than less unequal ones. Social mobility may partly explain whether problems congregate at the bottom, but not why more unequal societies have more problems overall. The view that social problems are caused directly by poor material conditions, such as bad housing, poor diets, lack of educational opportunities and so on, implies that richer developed societies would do better than the others. But this is a long way from the truth. Some of the richest countries do worst. It is remarkable that these measures of health and social problems in the two different settings and of child well-being among rich countries all tell so much the same story. The problems in rich countries are not caused by the society not being rich enough, or even by being too rich, but by the scale of material differences between people within each society being too big. What matters is where we stand in relation to others in our own society. Of course, a small proportion of the least well-off people, even in the richest countries, sometimes find themselves without enough money for food. However, surveys of the 12.6% of Americans living below the federal poverty line, an absolute income level rather than a relative standard such as half the average income, show that 80% of them have air conditioning, almost 75% own at least one car or truck, and around 33% have a computer, a dishwasher, or a second car. What this means is that when people lack money for essentials such as food, it is usually a reflection of the strength of their desire to live up to the prevailing standards. 
You may, for instance, feel it more important to maintain appearances by spending on clothes while stinting on food. We knew of a young man who was unemployed and had spent a month's income on a new mobile phone because he said girls ignored people who hadn't got the right stuff. As Adam Smith emphasized, it is important to be able to present oneself creditably in society without the shame and stigma of apparent poverty. However, just as the gradient in health ran right across society from top to bottom, the pressures of inequality and of wanting to keep up are not confined to a small minority who are poor. Instead, the effects are, as we shall see, widespread in the population. Different Problems, Common Roots The health and social problems which we have found to be related to inequality tend to be treated by policymakers as if they were quite separate from one another, each needing separate services and remedies. We pay doctors and nurses to treat ill health, police and prisons to deal with crime, remedial teachers and educational psychologists to tackle educational problems, and social workers, drug rehabilitation units, psychiatric services and health promotion experts to deal with a host of other problems. These services are all expensive, and none of them is more than partially effective. For instance, differences in the quality of medical care have less effect on people's life expectancy than social differences in their risks of getting some life-threatening disease in the first place. And even when the various services are successful in stopping someone re-offending, in curing a cancer, getting someone off drugs or dealing with educational failure, we know that our societies are endlessly recreating these problems in each new generation. Meanwhile, all these problems are most common in the most deprived areas of our society and are many times more common in more unequal societies. What does income inequality tell us? Before proceeding in the following chapters to look at how the scale of income differences may be related to other problems, we should say a few words about what we think income differences tell us about a society. Human beings have lived in every kind of society, from the most egalitarian prehistoric hunting and gathering societies to the most plutocratic dictatorships. Although modern market democracies fall into neither of those extremes, it is reasonable to assume that there are differences in how hierarchical they are. We believe that this is what income inequality is measuring. Where income differences are bigger, social distances are bigger, and social stratification more important. It would be nice to have lots of different indicators of the scale of hierarchy in different countries to be able to compare inequalities not only in income but also in wealth, education and power. It would also be interesting to see how they are related to social distances, to indicators of status like people's choice of clothes, music and films, or to the importance of hierarchy and position. While additional measures which can be compared between countries might become available in the future, at the moment we must rely simply on income inequality. But what is perhaps surprising is how much this measure tells us even on its own. There are two important reasons for interpreting income inequality in this way. The first pointer is that only the health and social problems which have strong social class gradients becoming more common further down the social hierarchy, are more common in more unequal societies. This seems to be a general phenomenon. The steeper the social gradient a problem has within society, the more strongly it will be related to inequality. This not only applies to each problem, to teenage birth rates or to children doing badly at school, for example, it looks as if it also applies to sex differences in the same problem. The reason why women's obesity rates turn out, as we shall see, to be more closely related to inequality than men's seems to be that the social gradient in obesity is steeper among women than men. Health problems such as breast cancer, which are not usually more common among the less well-off, are unrelated to inequality. The other pointer which suggests that income inequality reflects how hierarchical societies are became clear when we reviewed nearly 170 academic papers reporting different pieces of research on the relationship between income inequality and health. The size of the areas over which researchers had measured inequality varied substantially. 
Some had calculated how much inequality there was in local neighbourhoods and looked to see if it was related to average death rates in those neighbourhoods. Others had used whole towns and cities as the units in which inequality and health were measured. Still others had looked at regions and states or done international studies comparing whole countries. When we reviewed all this research, a clear pattern emerged. While there was overwhelming evidence that inequality was related to health when both were measured in large areas, regions, states or whole countries, the findings were much more mixed when inequality was measured in small local areas. This makes perfect sense if we think about why health tends to be worse in more deprived local areas. What marks out the neighbourhoods with poor health, where life expectancy may be as much as 10 years shorter than in the healthiest neighbourhoods, is not of course the inequality within them. It is instead that they are unequal or deprived in relation to the rest of society. What matters is the extent of inequality right across society. We concluded that, rather than telling us about some previously unknown influence on health or social problems, the scale of income differences in a society was telling us about the social hierarchy across which gradients in so many social outcomes occur. Because gradients in health and social problems reflect social status differences in culture and behaviour, it looks as if material inequality is probably central to those differences. We should perhaps regard the scale of material inequalities in a society as providing the skeleton, or framework, round which class and cultural differences are formed. Over time, crude differences in wealth gradually become overlaid by differences in clothing, aesthetic taste, education, sense of self, and all the other markers of class identity. Think, for instance, of how the comparatively recent emergence of huge income differences in Russia will come to affect its class structure. When the children of the new Russian oligarchs have grown up in grand houses, attended private schools and travelled the world, they will have developed all the cultural trappings of an upper class. A British conservative politician was famously described by another as someone who, quote, had to buy his own furniture, unquote. Although there has always been prejudice against the nouveau riche, wealth does not remain new forever. Once the furniture is inherited, it becomes old money. Even as far back as the 18th century, when people thought that birth and breeding were what defined the upper echelons of society, if you lost your fortune, you might maintain status briefly as genteel poor, but after a generation or so, there would be little to distinguish you from the rest of the poor. Moreover, as Jane Austen shows in both Mansfield Park and Sense and Sensibility, the consequences, whatever your birth, of marrying for love rather than money could be serious. Whether material wealth is made or lost, you cannot long remain a person of substance without it, and it is surely because material differences provide the framework round which social distinctions develop that people have often regarded inequality as socially divisive quality of life for all, and national standards of performance. Having come to the end of what higher material living standards can offer us, we are the first generation to have to find other ways of improving the real quality of life. The evidence shows that reducing inequality is the best way of improving the quality of the social environment, and so the real quality of life for all of us. As we shall see in chapter 13, this includes the better off. It is clear that greater equality, as well as improving the well-being of the whole population, is also the key to national standards of achievement and how countries perform in lots of different fields. When health inequalities first came to prominence on the public health agenda in the early 1980s, people would sometimes ask why there was so much fuss about inequalities. They argued that the task of people working in public health was to raise overall standards of health as fast as possible. In relation to that, it was suggested that health inequalities were a side issue of little relevance. We can now see that the situation may be almost the opposite of that. National standards of health and of other outcomes which we shall discuss in later chapters are substantially determined by the amount of inequality in a society. 
If you want to know why one country does better or worse than another, the first thing to look at is the extent of inequality. There is not one policy for reducing inequality in health or the educational performance of schoolchildren and another for raising national standards of performance. Reducing inequality is the best way of doing both. And if, for instance, a country wants higher average levels of educational achievement among its schoolchildren, it must address the underlying inequality which creates a steeper social gradient in educational achievement. Developing Countries Before leaving this topic, we should emphasize that although inequality also matters in developing countries, it may do so for a different mix of reasons. In the rich countries, it is now the symbolic importance of wealth and possessions that matters. What purchases say about status and identity is often more important than the goods themselves. Put crudely, second-rate goods are assumed to reflect second-rate people. Possessions are markers of status everywhere, but in poorer societies, where necessities are a much larger part of consumption, the reasons why more equal societies do better may have less to do with status issues and more to do with fewer people being denied access to food, clean water and shelter. It is only among the very richest countries that health and well-being are no longer related to gross national income per person. In poorer countries, it is still essential to raise living standards, and it is most important among the poorest. In those societies, a more equal distribution of resources will mean fewer people will be living in shanty towns with dirty water and food insecurity, or trying to scrape a living from inadequate land holdings. In the next chapter, we will look in a little more detail at why people in the developed world are so sensitive to inequality that it can exert such a major effect on the psychological and social well-being of modern populations. 3. How Inequality Gets Under the Skin Quote, "'Tis very certain that each man carries in his eye the exact indication of his rank in the immense scale of men, and we are always learning to read it." Unquote. Ralph Waldo Emerson, The Conduct of Life How is it that we are affected as strongly by inequality and our position within society as the data in the last chapter suggest? Before exploring, as we shall in the next nine chapters, the relations between inequality and a wide range of social problems, including those in our Index of Health and Social Problems, we want to suggest why human beings might be so sensitive to inequality. As inequality is an aspect of the broad structure of societies, explanations of its effects involve showing how individuals are affected by the social structure. It is individuals, not the societies themselves, who have poor health, are violent, or become teenage mothers. Although individuals do not have an income distribution, they do have a relative income, social status, or class position in the wider society. So in this chapter we will show the ways in which our individual sensitivity to the wider society explains why living in more unequal societies might have such profound effects. To understand our vulnerability to inequality means discussing some of our common psychological characteristics. Too often when we speak or write about these issues, people misinterpret our purpose. We are not suggesting that the problem is a matter of individual psychology, or that it is really people's sensitivity rather than the scale of inequality that should be changed. The solution to problems caused by inequality is not mass psychotherapy aimed at making everyone less vulnerable. The best way of responding to the harm done by high levels of inequality would be to reduce inequality itself. Rather than requiring anti-anxiety drugs in the water supply or mass psychotherapy, what is most exciting about the picture we present is that it shows that reducing inequality would increase the well-being and quality of life for all of us. Far from being inevitable and unstoppable, the sense of deterioration in social well-being and the quality of social relations in society is reversible. Understanding the effects of inequality means that we suddenly have a policy handle on the well-being of whole societies. 
The powerful mechanisms which make people sensitive to inequality cannot be understood in terms either of social structure or of individual psychology alone. Individual psychology and societal inequality relate to each other like lock and key. One reason why the effects of inequality have not been properly understood before is because of a failure to understand the relationship between them. The Rise in Anxiety Given the unprecedented material comfort and physical convenience of modern societies, it might seem sensible to be sceptical of the way everyone talks of stress as if life was barely survivable. However, Jean Twenge, a psychologist at San Diego State University, has put together impressive evidence that we really are much more anxious than we used to be. By reviewing the large number of studies of anxiety levels in the population carried out at different dates, she has documented very clear trends. She found 269 broadly comparable studies measuring anxiety levels in the USA at various times between 1952 and 1993. Together, the surveys covered over 52,000 individuals. What they showed was a continuous upward trend throughout this 40-year period. Her results for men and women are shown in Figure 3.1, each dot in the graph shows the average level of anxiety found in a study recorded against the date it was undertaken. The rising trend across so many studies is unmistakable. Whether she looked at college students or at children, Twenge found the same pattern. The average college student at the end of the period was more anxious than 85% of the population at the beginning of it, and even more staggering, by the late 1980s, the average American child was more anxious than child psychiatric patients in the 1950s. This evidence comes from the administration of standardized anxiety measures to samples of the population. It cannot be explained away by saying that people have become more aware of anxiety. The worsening trend also fits what we know has been happening in related conditions such as depression. Depression and anxiety are closely connected, People who suffer from one often suffer from the other, and psychiatrists sometimes treat the two conditions in similar ways. There are now large numbers of studies showing substantial increases in rates of depression in developed countries. Some studies have looked at change over the last half century or so by comparing the experience of one generation with another, while taking care to avoid pitfalls such as an increased awareness leading to more frequent reporting of depression. Others have compared rates in studies which have followed up representative samples of the population born in different years. In Britain, for example, depression measured among people in their mid-twenties was found to be twice as common in a study of 10,000 or so people born in 1970 as it had been in a similar study carried out earlier of people in their mid-twenties born in 1958. Reviews of research conclude that people in many developed countries have experienced substantial rises in anxiety and depression. Among adolescents, these have been accompanied by increases in the frequency of behavioral problems, including crime, alcohol, and drugs. They affected males and females in all social classes and all family types. It is important to understand what these rises in anxiety are about before their relevance to inequality becomes clear. We are not suggesting that they were triggered by increased inequality. That possibility can be discounted because the rises in anxiety and depression seem to start well before the increases in inequality which in many countries took place during the last quarter of the 20th century. It is possible, however, that the trends between the 1970s and 1990s may have been aggravated by increased inequality. This is the end of the CD. The audiobook continues on the next CD. Self-esteem and social insecurity An important clue to what lies behind the mental health trends comes from evidence that they were accompanied by a surprising rise in what at first was thought to be self-esteem. When compared over time, in much the same way as the trends in anxiety are shown in Figure 3.1, standard measures of self-esteem also showed a very clear long-term upward trend. 
it looks as if, despite the rising anxiety levels, people were also taking a more positive view of themselves over time. They were, for instance, more likely to say they felt proud of themselves. They were more likely to agree with statements such as, I am a person of worth and they seemed to have put aside self-doubts and feelings that they were useless or no good at all. Twenge says that in the 1950s only 12% of teenagers agreed with the statement, I am an important person, but by the late 1980s this proportion had risen to 80%. So what could have been going on? People becoming much more self-confident doesn't seem to fit with them also becoming much more anxious and depressed. The answer turns out to be a picture of increasing anxieties about how we are seen and what others think of us, which has in turn produced a kind of defensive attempt to shore up our confidence in the face of those insecurities. The defense involves a kind of self-promoting insecure egotism, which is easily mistaken for high self-esteem. This might seem like a difficult set of issues to pin down, particularly as we are talking about general trends in whole populations. But let us look briefly at the evidence which has accumulated since the self-esteem movement of the 1980s, which shows what has been happening. Over the years, many research groups looking at individual differences in self-esteem at a point in time, rather than at trends in population averages over time, began to notice two categories of people who came out with high scores. In one category, high self-esteem went with positive outcomes and was associated with happiness, confidence, being able to accept criticism, an ability to make friends, and so on. But as well as positive outcomes, studies repeatedly found that there was another group who scored well on self-esteem measures. They were people who showed tendencies to violence, to racism, who were insensitive to others and were bad at personal relationships. The task was then to develop psychological tests which could distinguish between people with a healthy and those with an unhealthy kind of self-esteem. The healthier kind seemed to center on a fairly well-founded sense of confidence with a reasonably accurate view of one's strengths in different situations and an ability to recognize one's weaknesses. The other seemed to be primarily defensive and involved a denial of weaknesses, a kind of internal attempt to talk oneself up and maintain a positive sense of oneself in the face of threats to self-esteem. It was, and is, therefore, fragile, like whistling in the dark, and reacts badly to criticism. People with insecure high self-esteem tend to be insensitive to others and to show an excessive preoccupation with themselves, with success, and with their image and appearance in the eyes of others. This unhealthy high self-esteem is often called threatened egotism, insecure high self-esteem, or narcissism. During the comparatively short time over which data are available to compare trends in narcissism without getting it mixed up with real self-esteem, Twenge has shown a rising trend. She found that by 2006, two-thirds of American college students scored above what had been the average narcissism score in 1982. The recognition that what we have seen is the rise of an insecure narcissism, particularly among young people, rather than a rise in genuine self-esteem, now seems widely accepted. Threats to the social self So the picture of self-esteem rising along with anxiety levels isn't true. It is now fairly clear that the rises in anxiety have been accompanied by rising narcissism and that the two have common roots. Both are caused by an increase in what has been called social evaluative threat. There are now good pointers to the main sources of stress in modern societies. As living with high levels of stress is now recognized as harmful to health, Researchers have spent a lot of time trying to understand both how the body responds to stress and what the most important sources of stress are in society at large. Much of the research has been focused on a central stress hormone called cortisol, which can be easily measured in saliva or blood. Its release is triggered by the brain, and it serves to prepare us physiologically for dealing with potential threats and emergencies. 
There have now been numerous experiments in which volunteers have been invited to come into a laboratory to have their salivary cortisol levels measured while being exposed to some situation or task designed to be stressful. Different experiments have used different stressors. Some have tried asking volunteers to do a series of arithmetic problems, sometimes publicly comparing results with those of others. Some have exposed them to loud noises or asked them to write about an unpleasant experience or filmed them while doing a task. Because so many different kinds of stressor have been used in these experiments, Sally Dickerson and Margaret Kemeny, both psychologists at the University of California, Los Angeles, realized that they could use the results of all these experiments to see what kinds of stressors most reliably caused people's cortisol levels to rise. They collected findings from 208 published reports of experiments in which people's cortisol levels were measured while they were exposed to an experimental stressor. They classified all the different kinds of stressor used in experiments and found that, quote, tasks that included a social evaluative threat, such as threats to self-esteem or social status, in which others could negatively judge performance, particularly when the outcome of the performance was uncontrollable, provoked larger and more reliable cortisol changes than stressors without these particular threats, unquote. Indeed, they suggested that, quote, human beings are driven to preserve the social self and are vigilant to threats that may jeopardize their social esteem or status, unquote. Social evaluative threats were those which created the possibility for loss of esteem. They typically involved the presence of an evaluative audience in the experiment, a potential for negative social comparison, such as scoring worse than someone else, or having your performance videoed or recorded, so creating the potential for later evaluation. The highest cortisol responses came when a social evaluative threat was combined with a task in which participants could not avoid failure, for instance because the task was designed to be impossible, or because there was too little time, or they were simply told they were failing however they performed. The finding that social evaluative threats are the stressors which get to us most powerfully fits well with the evidence of rising anxiety accompanied by a narcissistic defense of an insecure self-image. As Dickerson and Kemeny say, the social self which we try to defend, quote, reflects one's esteem and status and is largely based on others' perception of one's worth, unquote. A quite separate strand of health research corroborates and fills out this picture. One of the most important recent developments in our understanding of the factors exerting a major influence on health in rich countries has been the recognition of the importance of psychological stress. We will outline in Chapter 6 how frequent and or prolonged stress affects the body, influencing many physiological systems, including the immune and cardiovascular systems. But what matters to us in this chapter is that the most powerful sources of stress affecting health seem to fall into three intensely social categories, low social status, lack of friends, and stress in early life. All have been shown in many well-controlled studies to be seriously detrimental to health and longevity. Much the most plausible interpretation of why these keep cropping up as markers for stress in modern societies is that they all affect, or reflect, the extent to which we do or do not feel at ease and confident with each other. Insecurities which can come from a stressful early life have some similarities with the insecurities which can come from low social status, and each can exacerbate the effects of the other. Friendship has a protective effect because we feel more secure and at ease with friends. Friends make you feel appreciated, they find you good company, enjoy your conversation, they like you. If, in contrast, we lack friends and feel avoided by others, then few of us are thick-skinned enough not to fall prey to self-doubts, to worries that people find us unattractive and boring, that they think we are stupid or socially inept. Pride, Shame, and Status The psychoanalyst Alfred Adler said, quote, To be human means to feel inferior, unquote. Perhaps he should have said, To be human means being highly sensitive about being regarded as inferior. Our sensitivity to such feelings makes it easy to understand the contrasting effects of high and low social status on confidence. 
how people see you matters. While it is of course possible to be upper class and still feel totally inadequate, or to be lower class and full of confidence, in general, the further up the social ladder you are, the more help the world seems to give you in keeping the self-doubts at bay. If the social hierarchy is seen, as it often is, as if it were a ranking of the human race by ability, then the outward signs of success or failure, the better jobs, higher incomes, education, housing, car and clothes, all make a difference. It's hard to disregard social status, because it comes so close to defining our worth and how much we are valued. To do well for yourself or to be successful is almost synonymous with moving up the social ladder. Higher status almost always carries connotations of being better, superior, more successful and more able. If you don't want to feel small, incapable, looked down on or inferior, it is not quite essential to avoid low social status, but the further up the social ladder you are, the easier it becomes to feel a sense of pride, dignity and self-confidence. Social comparisons increasingly show you in a positive light, whether they are comparisons of wealth, education, job status, where you live, holidays or any other markers of success. Not only do advertisers play on our sensitivity to social comparisons, knowing we will tend to buy things which enhance how we are seen, but as we shall see in Chapter 10, one of the most common causes of violence, and one which plays a large part in explaining why violence is more common in more unequal societies, is that it is often triggered by loss of face and humiliation when people feel looked down on and disrespected. By playing on our fears of being seen as of less worth, advertisers may even contribute to the level of violence in a society. It was Thomas Sheff, Emeritus Professor of Sociology at the University of California, Santa Barbara, who said that shame was THE social emotion. He meant almost exactly what Dickerson and Kemeny were referring to when they found that the most likely kinds of stressors to raise levels of stress hormones were social evaluative threats. By shame, he meant the range of emotions to do with feeling foolish, stupid, ridiculous, inadequate, defective, incompetent, awkward, exposed, vulnerable and insecure. Shame and its opposite, pride, are rooted in the processes through which we internalize how we imagine others see us. Chef called shame the social emotion because pride and shame provide the social evaluative feedback as we experience ourselves as if through others' eyes. Pride is the pleasure and shame the pain through which we are socialized so that we learn from early childhood onwards to behave in socially acceptable ways. Nor, of course, does it stop in childhood. Our sensitivity to shame continues to provide the basis for conformity throughout adult life. People often find even the smallest infringement of social norms in the presence of others causes so much embarrassment that they are left wishing they could just disappear or that the ground would swallow them up. Although the Dickerson and Kemeny study found that it was exposure to social evaluative threats which most reliably raised levels of stress hormones, that does not tell us how frequently people suffer from such anxieties. Are they a very common part of everyday life or only occasional? An answer to that question comes from the health research showing that low social status, lack of friends, and a difficult early childhood are the most important markers of psychosocial stress in modern societies. If our interpretation of these three factors is right, it suggests that these kinds of social anxiety and insecurity are the most common sources of stress in modern societies. Helen Lewis, a psychoanalyst who drew people's attention to shame emotions, thought she saw very frequent behavioural indications of shame or embarrassment, perhaps not much more than we would call a momentary feeling of awkwardness or self-consciousness, when her patients gave an embarrassed laugh or hesitated at particular points while speaking in a way suggesting slight nervousness. From Community to Mass Society why have these social anxieties increased so dramatically over the last half century, as Twenge's studies showing rising levels of anxiety and fragile narcissistic egos suggest they have? Why does the social evaluative threat seem so great? A plausible explanation is the breakup of the settled communities of the past. 
People used to grow up knowing and being known by many of the same people all their lives. Although geographical mobility had been increasing for several generations, the last half century has seen a particularly rapid rise. At the beginning of this period, it was still common for people, in rural and urban areas alike, never to have travelled much beyond the boundaries of their immediate city or village community. Married brothers and sisters, parents and grandparents tended to remain living nearby, and the community consisted of people who had often known each other for much of their lives. But now that so many people move from where they grew up, knowledge of neighbours tends to be superficial or non-existent. People's sense of identity used to be embedded in the community to which they belonged, in people's real knowledge of each other, but now it is cast adrift in the anonymity of mass society. Familiar faces have been replaced by a constant flux of strangers. As a result, who we are, identity itself, is endlessly open to question. The problem is shown even in the difficulty we have in distinguishing between the concept of the esteem in which we may or may not be held by others and our own self-esteem. The evidence of our sensitivity to social evaluative threat, coupled with Twenge's evidence of long-term rises in anxiety and narcissism, suggests that we may, by the standards of any previous society, have become highly self-conscious, obsessed with how we appear to others, worried that we might come across as unattractive, boring, stupid or whatever, and constantly trying to manage the impressions we make. And at the core of our interactions with strangers is our concern at the social judgments and evaluations they might make. How do they rate us? Did we give a good account of ourselves? This vulnerability is part of the modern psychological condition and feeds directly into consumerism. It is well known that these problems are particularly difficult for adolescents. While their sense of themselves is most uncertain, they have to cope in schools of a thousand or more of their peers. It is hardly surprising that peer pressure becomes such a powerful force in their lives that so many are dissatisfied with what they look like or succumb to depression and self-harm. Inequality increases evaluation anxieties. Although the rises in anxiety that seem to centre on social evaluation predate the rise in inequality, it is not difficult to see how rising inequality and social status differences may impact on them. Rather than being entirely separate spheres, how much status and wealth people achieve, from unskilled low-paid work to success, money and preeminence, affects not only their sense of themselves, but also how positively they are seen even by friends and family. Our need to feel valued and capable human beings means we crave positive feedback and often react with anger even to implied criticism. Social status carries the strongest messages of superiority and inferiority, and social mobility is widely seen as a process by which people are sorted by ability. Indeed, in job applications and promotions, where discrimination by age, sex, race or religion is prohibited, it is the task of the interview panel to discriminate between individuals exclusively by ability, just as long as they don't make inferences from gender or skin colour, etc. Greater inequality seems to heighten people's social evaluation anxieties by increasing the importance of social status. Instead of accepting each other as equals on the basis of our common humanity as we might in more equal settings, getting the measure of each other becomes more important as status differences widen. We come to see social position as a more important feature of a person's identity. Between strangers it may often be the dominant feature. As Ralph Waldo Emerson, the 19th century American philosopher, said, quote, Tis very certain that each man carries in his eye the exact indication of his rank in the immense scale of men, and we are always learning to read it." Unquote. Indeed, psychological experiments suggest that we make judgments of each other's social status within the first few seconds of meeting. No wonder first impressions count, and no wonder we feel social evaluation anxieties. If inequalities are bigger, so that some people seem to count for almost everything and others for practically nothing, where each one of us is placed becomes more important. Greater inequality is likely to be accompanied by increased status competition and increased status anxiety. 
It is not simply that where the stakes are higher, each of us worries more about where he or she comes. It is also that we are likely to pay more attention to social status in how we assess each other. Surveys have found that when choosing prospective marriage partners, people in more unequal countries put less emphasis on romantic considerations and more on criteria such as financial prospects, status and ambition than do people in less unequal societies. Self-promotion replaces self-deprecation and modesty. Comparing Japan with the USA, that is, the most equal with almost the most unequal of the rich market democracies, see figure 2.1, research has revealed a stark contrast between the way people see and present themselves to others in the two countries. In Japan, people choose a much more self-deprecating and self-critical way of presenting themselves, which contrasts sharply with the much more self-enhancing style in the USA. While Americans are more likely to attribute individual successes to their own abilities and their failures to external factors, the Japanese tend to do just the opposite. More than 20 studies in Japan have failed to find any evidence of the more self-serving pattern of attributions common in the USA. In Japan, people tended to pass their successes off as if they were more a reflection of luck than of judgment, while suggesting their failures are probably attributable to their own lack of ability. This Japanese pattern was also found in Taiwan and China. Rather than getting too caught up in psychological terminology, we would do well to see these patterns as differences in how far people value personal modesty, preferring to maintain social bonds by not using their successes to build themselves up as more able than others. As greater inequality increases status competition and social evaluative threat, egos have to be propped up by self-promoting and self-enhancing strategies. Modesty easily becomes a casualty of inequality. We become outwardly tougher and harder in the face of greater exposure to social evaluation anxieties, but inwardly, as the literature on narcissism suggests, probably more vulnerable, less able to take criticism, less good at personal relationships, and less able to recognize our own faults. Liberty, Equality, and Fraternity the demand for liberty, equality and fraternity during the French Revolution shows just how long the issues we have been discussing here have been recognized. The slogan focused attention on the dimensions of social relations which matter most if we are to create a better society and make a difference to the real quality of our lives. Liberty meant not being subservient or beholden to the feudal nobility and landed aristocracy, it was liberty from the feudal shackles of inferiority. Similarly, fraternity reflects a desire for greater mutuality and reciprocity in social relations. We raise the same issues when we talk about community, social cohesion or solidarity. Their importance to human well-being is demonstrated repeatedly in research which shows how beneficial friendship and involvement in community life is to health. Equality comes into the picture as a precondition for getting the other two right. Not only do large inequalities produce all the problems associated with social differences and the divisive class prejudices which go with them, but as later chapters show, it also weakens community life, reduces trust, and increases violence. Part 2. The Costs of Inequality 4. Community Life and Social Relations Quote, Among the new objects that attracted my attention during my stay in the United States, none struck me with greater force than the equality of conditions. I easily perceived the enormous influence that this primary fact exercises on the workings of the society. Unquote. Alexis de Tocqueville, Democracy in America in August 2005, Hurricane Katrina hit the Gulf Coast of the southern United States, devastating cities in Mississippi and Louisiana, overwhelming flood protection systems, and leaving 80% of the city of New Orleans under water. A mandatory evacuation order was issued for the city the day before the storm hit, but by that time most public transport had shut down and fuel and rental cars were unavailable. 
The city government set up refuges of last resort for people who couldn't get out of New Orleans, including the Superdome, a vast sports arena, which ended up sheltering around 26,000 people, despite sections of its roof being ripped off by the storm. At least 1,836 people were killed by the hurricane, and another 700 people were missing and unaccounted for. What captured the attention of the world's media in the aftermath of the storm, as much as the physical devastation, the flattened houses, flooded streets, collapsed highways and battered oil rigs, was what seemed like the complete breakdown of civilization in the city. There were numerous arrests and shootouts throughout the week following the hurricane. Television news screens showed desperate residents begging for help, for baby food, for medicine, and then switched to images of troops cruising the flooded streets in boats, not evacuating people, not bringing them supplies, but fully armed with automatic weapons looking for looters. This response to chaos in New Orleans led to widespread criticism and condemnation within the U.S., Many alleged that the lack of trust between law enforcement and military forces on the one hand, and the mostly poor black citizens of New Orleans on the other, reflected deeper issues of race and class. During a widely televised benefit concert for victims of the hurricane, musician Kanye West burst out, quote, I hate the way they portray us in the media. You see a white family, it says, they're looking for food. You see a black family, it says, they're looting, unquote. As troops were mobilized to go into the city, Louisiana Governor Kathleen Blanco said, quote, They have M-16s and are locked and loaded. These troops know how to shoot and kill, and I expect they will, unquote. The lack of trust on display during the rescue efforts in New Orleans was also roundly condemned internationally, countries around the world offered aid and assistance, while their news coverage was filled with criticism. We can contrast the way in which troops in New Orleans seem to be used primarily to control the population with the rapid deployment of unarmed soldiers in rescue and relief missions in China after the devastating earthquake of 2008, a response widely applauded by the international community. The Equality of Conditions a very different vision of America is offered by one of its earliest observers. Alexis de Tocqueville traveled through the United States in 1831. He met presidents and ex-presidents, mayors, senators and judges, as well as ordinary citizens, and everywhere he went he was impressed by the equality of conditions, the blending of social ranks and the abolition of privileges, the way that society was one single mass at least for whites. He wrote that Americans of all ages, conditions, and all dispositions constantly unite together, that strangers readily congregate in the same places and find neither danger nor advantage in telling each other freely what they think, their manner being natural, open, and unreserved. And de Tocqueville points out the ways in which Americans support one another in times of trouble. Quote, should some unforeseen accident occur on the public highway, people run from all sides to help the victim. Should some family fall foul of an unexpected disaster, a thousand strangers willingly open their purses." Unquote. De Tocqueville believed that the equality of conditions he observed had helped to develop and maintain trust among Americans. What's trust got to do with it? But does inequality corrode trust and divide people, government from citizens, rich from poor, minority from majority? This chapter shows that the quality of social relations deteriorates in less equal societies. Inequality, not surprisingly, is a powerful social divider, perhaps because we all tend to use differences in living standards as markers of status differences. We tend to choose our friends from among our near equals and have little to do with those much richer or much poorer, and when we have less to do with other kinds of people, it's harder for us to trust them. Our position in the social hierarchy affects who we see as part of the in-group and who as out-group, us and them, so affecting our ability to identify with and empathize with other people. 
Later in the book, we'll show that inequality not only has an impact on how much we look down on others because they have less than we do, but also affects other kinds of discrimination, such as racism and sexism, with attitudes sometimes justified by statements like, they just don't live like us. De Tocqueville understood this point. A lifelong opponent of slavery, he wrote about the exclusion of both African Americans and Native Americans from the liberty and equality enjoyed by other Americans. Slavery, he thought, could only be maintained because African Americans were viewed as other, so much so that the European is to other races what man himself is to the animals. Empathy is only felt for those we view as equals. The same feeling for one another does not exist between the different classes. Prejudice, thought de Tocqueville, was an imaginary inequality which followed the real inequality produced by wealth and the law. Early socialists and others believed that material inequality was an obstacle to a wider human harmony, to a universal human brotherhood, sisterhood or comradeship. The data we present in this chapter suggest that this intuition was sound, inequality is divisive, and even small differences seem to make an important difference. Income Inequality and Trust Figures 4.1 and 4.2 show that levels of trust between members of the public are lower in countries and states where income differences are larger. These relationships are strong enough that we can be confident that they are not due to chance. The international data on trust in Figure 4.1 come from the European and World Values Survey, a study designed to allow international comparisons of values and norms. In each country, random samples of the population were asked whether or not they agreed with the statement, most people can be trusted. The differences between countries are large. People trust each other most in the Scandinavian countries and the Netherlands. Sweden has the highest levels of trust, with 66% of people feeling that they can trust others. The lowest level of trust is seen in Portugal, where only 10% of the population believe that others can be trusted. So just within these rich market democracies, there are more than six-fold differences in levels of trust, and as the graph shows, high levels of trust are linked to low levels of inequality. The data on trust within the USA, shown in Figure 4.2, are taken from the federal government's General Social Survey, which has been monitoring social change in America for more than a quarter of a century. In this survey, just as in the international surveys, people are asked whether or not they agree that most people can be trusted. Within the USA, there are fourfold differences in trust between states. North Dakota has a level of trust similar to that of Sweden. 67% feel they can trust other people, whereas in Mississippi, only 17% of the population believe that people can be trusted. Just as with the international data, low levels of trust among the United States are related to high inequality. The important message in these graphs of trust and inequality is that they indicate how different life must feel to people living in these different societies. Imagine living somewhere where 90% of the population mistrusts one another and what that must mean for the quality of everyday life, the interactions between people at work, on the street, in shops, in schools. In Norway, it is not unusual to see cafes with tables and chairs on the pavement and blankets left out for people to use if they feel chilly while having a coffee. Nobody worries about customers or passers-by stealing the blankets. Many people feel nostalgic for time past when they could leave their doors unlocked and trusted that a lost wallet would be handed in. Of all large U.S. cities, New Orleans is one of the most unequal, this was the background to the tensions and mistrust in the scenes of chaos after Hurricane Katrina that we described above. Chicken or Egg In the USA, trust has fallen from a high of 60% in 1960 to a low of less than 40% by 2004. But does inequality create low levels of trust, or does mistrust create inequality? Which comes first? Political scientist Robert Putnam of Harvard University, in his book Bowling Alone, shows how inequality is related to social capital, 
by which he means the sum total of people's involvement in community life, he says, quote, Community and equality are mutually reinforcing. Social capital and economic equality moved in tandem through most of the 20th century. In terms of the distribution of wealth and income, America in the 1950s and 1960s was more egalitarian than it had been in more than a century. Those same decades were also the high point of social connectedness and civic engagement. Record highs in equality and social capital coincided. Conversely, the last third of the 20th century was a time of growing inequality and eroding social capital. The timing of the two trends is striking. Sometime around 1965 to 70, America reversed course and started becoming both less just economically and less well connected socially and politically. Unquote. In another article, Putnam says, quote, The causal arrows are likely to run in both directions, with citizens in high social capital states likely to do more to reduce inequalities, and inequalities themselves likely to be socially divisive. Unquote. Taking a more definite stance in his book The Moral Foundations of Trust, Eric Uslaner, a political scientist at the University of Maryland, believes that it is inequality that affects trust, not the other way round. If we live in societies with more social capital, then we know more people as friends and neighbours, and that might increase our trust of people we know, people we feel are like us. But Uslaner points out that the kind of trust that is being measured in surveys such as the European and World Values Survey is trust of strangers, of people we don't know, people who are often not like us. Using a wealth of data from different sources, he shows that people who trust others are optimists with a strong sense of control over their lives. The kind of parenting that people receive also affects their trust of other people. In a study with his colleague Bo Rothstein, Uslaner shows, using a statistical test for causality, that inequality affects trust, but that there is no direct effect of trust on inequality, Rather, the causal direction starts with inequality. Uslaner says that trust cannot thrive in an unequal world, and that income inequality is the prime mover of trust, with a stronger impact on trust than rates of unemployment, inflation, or economic growth. It is not average levels of economic well-being that create trust, but economic equality. Uslaner's graph showing that trust has declined in the USA during a period in which inequality rapidly increased is shown in figure 4.3. The numbers on the graph show for each year, 1960 to 98, the relation between the level of trust and inequality in that year. Changes in inequality and trust go together over the years. With greater inequality, people are less caring of one another, there is less mutuality in relationships, people have to fend for themselves and get what they can, so inevitably there is less trust. Mistrust and inequality reinforce each other. As de Tocqueville pointed out, we are less likely to empathize with those not seen as equals. Material differences serve to divide us socially. Trust matters. Both Putnam and Uslaner make the point that trust leads to cooperation. Uslaner shows that in the USA, people who trust others are more likely to donate time and money to helping other people. Trusters also tend to believe in a common culture that America is held together by shared values, that everybody should be treated with respect and tolerance. They are also supportive of the legal order. Trust affects the well-being of individuals as well as the well-being of civic society. High levels of trust mean that people feel secure, they have less to worry about, they see others as cooperative rather than competitive. A number of convincing studies in the USA have linked trust to health. People with high levels of trust live longer. In fact, People who trust others benefit from living in communities with generally high levels of trust, whereas people who are less trusting of others fare worse in such neighborhoods. Trust, or lack of it, meant the difference between life and death for some people caught up in the chaotic aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. Trust was also crucial for survival in the Chicago heat wave of 1995. 
Sociologist Eric Kleinberg, in his book about the heat wave, showed how poor African Americans, living in areas with low levels of trust and high levels of crime, were too frightened to open their windows or doors, or leave their homes to go to local cooling centers established by the city authorities. Neighbors didn't check on neighbors, and hundreds of elderly and vulnerable people died. In equally poor Hispanic neighborhoods, characterized by high levels of trust and active community life, the risk of death was much lower. Raiders and Mavericks Perhaps another marker of corroded social relations and lack of trust among people was the rapid rise in the popularity of the sport utility vehicle, SUV, through the 1980s and 1990s. These vehicles are known in the UK by the derogatory term Chelsea Tractors. Chelsea being a rich area of London, the name draws attention to the silliness of driving rugged off-road vehicles in busy urban areas. But the vehicles themselves have names that evoke images of hunters and outdoorsmen, Outlander, Pathfinder, Cherokee, Wrangler, etc. Others evoke an even tougher image of soldiers and warriors, with names like Trooper, Defender, Shogun, Raider and Crossfire. These are vehicles for the urban jungle, not the real thing. Not only did the popularity of SUVs suggest a preoccupation with looking tough, it also reflected growing mistrust and the need to feel safe from others. Josh Lauer, in his paper Driven to Extremes, asked why military ruggedness became prized above speed or sleekness, and what the rise of the SUV said about American society. He concluded that the trend reflected American attitudes towards crime and violence, an admiration for rugged individualism and the importance of shutting oneself off from contact with others, mistrust. These are not large vehicles born from a cooperative public spiritedness and a desire to give lifts to hitchhikers. Hitchhiking started to decline just as inequality started to rise in the 1970s. As one anthropologist has observed, people attempt to shield themselves from the threats of a harsh and untrusting society by riding in SUVs which look armoured and by trying to appear as intimidating as possible to potential attackers. Pollster Michael Adams, writing about the contrasting values of the USA and Canada, pointed out that minivans outsell SUVs in Canada by two to one. The ratio is reversed in America, and Canada is of course more equal than America. Accompanying the rise in SUVs were other signs of Americans' increasing uneasiness and fear of one another. Growing numbers of gated communities and increasing sales of home security systems. In more recent years, due to the steeply rising cost of filling their fuel tanks, sales of SUVs have declined, but people still want that rugged image. Sales of smaller, tough-looking crossover vehicles continue to rise. Women's status In several respects, more unequal societies seem more masculine, at least in terms of the stereotypes. When we put this to the test, we found that just as levels of trust and social relations are affected by inequality, so too is the status of women. In the USA, the Institute for Women's Policy Research produces measures of the status of women. Using these measures, researchers at Harvard University showed that women's status was linked to state-level income inequality. Three of the measures are women's political participation, women's employment and earnings, and women's social and economic autonomy. When we combine these measures for each U.S. state and relate them to state levels of income inequality, we also find that women's status is significantly worse in more unequal states, although this is not a particularly strong relationship, figure 4.4. The fairly wide scatter of points around the line on the graph shows that factors besides inequality affect women's status. Nevertheless, there is a tendency that cannot be put down to chance for fewer women to vote or hold political office, for women to earn less and fewer women to complete college degrees in more unequal states. Internationally, we find the same thing, and we show this relationship in figure 4.5. 
combining measures of the percentage of women in the legislature, the male-female income gap, and the percentage of women completing higher education to make an index of women's status, we find that more equal countries do significantly better. Japan is conspicuous among the most equal countries in that women's status is lower than we would expect given its level of inequality. Italy also has worse women's status than expected, and Sweden does better. As with the scattering of points on the American graph above, this shows that other factors are also influencing women's status. In both Japan and Italy, women have traditionally had lower status than men, whereas Sweden has a long tradition of women's rights and empowerment. But again, the link between income inequality and women's status cannot be explained by chance alone, and there is a tendency for women's status to be better in more equal countries. Epidemiologists have found that in U.S. states where women's status is higher, both men and women have lower death rates, and women's status seems to matter for all women, whether rich or poor. Trust Beyond Borders Not surprisingly, just as individuals who trust other people are more likely to give to charity, more equal countries are also more generous to poorer countries. The United Nations' target for spending on foreign development aid is 0.7% of gross national income. Only Norway, Sweden, Denmark and the Netherlands meet that target. Indeed, they are generous beyond what the United Nations expects, and as we show in Figure 4.6 using data from the OECD, more unequal countries spend significantly lower percentages of their income on foreign aid. Japan and the UK might be seen as outliers on this graph. Perhaps Japan's lower-than-expected spending on aid reflects its withdrawal from the international stage following the Second World War, and the UK's higher-than-expected spending reflects historical colonial ties to many developing countries. What we have learned In this chapter, we have shown that levels of social trust are connected to income inequality, but of course showing a correlation is not the same thing as showing causality. There are several reasons why we believe that equality is the precondition for greater trust, although almost certainly there is a feedback loop between the two. One factor is the strength of the relationship, which is shown by the steepness of the lines in figures 4.1 and 4.2. People in Sweden are much more likely to trust each other than people in Portugal. Any alternative explanation would need to be just as strong, and in our own statistical models, we find that neither poverty nor average standards of living can explain our findings. We also see a consistent association among both the United States and the developed countries. Earlier, we described how Uslaner and Rothstein used a statistical model to show the ordering of inequality and trust. Inequality affects trust, not the other way round. The relationships between inequality and women's status and between inequality and foreign aid also add coherence and plausibility to our belief that inequality increases the social distance between different groups of people, making us less willing to see them as us rather than them. In summary, we can think of trust as an important marker of the ways in which greater material equality can help to create a cohesive, cooperative community to the benefit of all. 5. Mental health and drug use Quote, It is no measure of health to be well adjusted to a profoundly sick society. Unquote. Krishnamurti Mental illness in the UK and USA Children's mental health now makes the front pages of newspapers, Britain's Daily Mail, for example, under banner headlines such as The Disturbed Generation. A million British children, one in ten between the ages of five and sixteen, are estimated to be mentally ill. It has been suggested that in any secondary school with a thousand students, fifty will be severely depressed, 100 will be distressed, 10 to 20 will be suffering from obsessive-compulsive disorder, and between 5 and 10 girls will have an eating disorder. This is backed up by a 2008 report from the Good Childhood Inquiry, an independent inquiry commissioned by the Children's Society. 
After surveying thousands of children, they report that increasing numbers of children have mental health problems, over a quarter regularly feeling depressed, mostly as a result of family breakdown and peer pressure. In the USA, 6% of children have been diagnosed with Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, a behavioral syndrome characterized by serious distractibility, impulsivity and restlessness. In a national survey, almost 10% of children aged 3 to 17 had moderate or severe difficulties in the areas of emotions, concentration, behavior, or being able to get along with other people. And how are adults doing in these same two societies? In the UK, in a national survey conducted in 2000, 23% of adults had either a neurotic disorder, a psychotic disorder, or were addicted to alcohol or drugs, 4% of adults having more than one disorder. In 2005, doctors in England alone wrote 29 million prescriptions for antidepressant drugs, costing over £400 million to the National Health Service. In the USA, one in four adults have been mentally ill in the past year, and almost a quarter of these episodes were severe. Over their lifetime, more than half will suffer from a mental illness. In 2003, the USA spent $100 billion on mental health treatments. Mental well-being before we turn to comparisons of mental illness in other societies, it's worth asking, what is a healthy mind? MIND, the National Association for Mental Health in the UK, publishes a pamphlet called How to Improve Your Mental Well-Being. It begins with the premise that, quote, Good mental health isn't something you have, but something you do. To be mentally healthy, you must value and accept yourself. It concludes that people who are mentally well are able to look after themselves, see themselves as valuable people, and judge themselves by reasonable rather than unrealistic standards. People who don't value themselves become frightened of rejection. They keep others at a distance and get trapped in a vicious circle of loneliness. It is also important to note that although people with mental illness sometimes have changes in the levels of certain chemicals in their brains, Nobody has shown that these are causes of depression rather than changes caused by depression. Similarly, although genetic vulnerability may underlie some mental illness, this can't by itself explain the huge rises in illness in recent decades. Our genes can't change that fast. Apples and oranges? Can we really compare levels of mental illness in different countries? Don't different cultures have different labels for mental disorders and different standards of normality or tolerance of differences? Aren't people in different societies more or less reluctant to admit to emotional problems or drug use or any stigmatized condition? Not surprisingly, it hasn't always been easy to get comparable measures of how many people are suffering from mental illness in different countries. But this began to get easier in the 1980s, when researchers developed diagnostic interviews Sets of questions that could be asked by non-psychiatrists and non-psychologists, allowing researchers to measure on a large scale the numbers of people meeting diagnostic criteria for different mental illnesses. In 1998, the World Health Organization set up the World Mental Health Survey Consortium in an attempt to estimate the numbers of people with mental illness in different countries, the severity of their illness and patterns of treatment. Although their methods don't entirely overcome worries about cultural differences in interpreting and responding to such questions, at least the same questions are being asked in the same way in different places. Among our set of rich developed countries, WHO surveys have been completed in nine – Belgium, France, Germany, Italy, Japan, Netherlands, New Zealand, Spain and the USA. Although not strictly comparable, very similar national surveys give estimates of the proportion of the adult population with mental illness in another three countries, Australia, Canada and the UK. Income inequality and mental illness In Figure 5.1, we use these surveys to show the association in rich countries between income inequality and the proportion of adults who have been mentally ill in the 12 months prior to being interviewed. 
This is a strong relationship. A much higher percentage of the population suffer from mental illness in more unequal countries. Such a close relationship cannot be due to chance. Indeed, the countries line up almost perfectly, with only Italy standing out as having lower levels of mental illness than we might expect, based on its level of income inequality. Just as we saw with levels of trust in the previous chapter, there are big differences in the proportion of people with mental illness, from 8% to 26% between countries. In Germany, Italy, Japan and Spain, fewer than 1 in 10 people had been mentally ill within the previous year. In Australia, Canada, New Zealand and the UK, the numbers are more than 1 in 5 people. And in the USA, as we described above, more than 1 in 4. Overall, it looks as if differences in inequality tally with more than threefold differences in the percentage of people with mental illness in different countries. For our nine countries with data from the WHO surveys, we can also look at subtypes of mental illness, specifically anxiety disorders, mood disorders, impulse control disorders and addictions, as well as a measure of severe mental illness. Anxiety disorders, impulse control disorders and severe illness are all strongly correlated with inequality, mood disorders less so. We saw in Chapter 3 how anxiety has been increasing in developed countries in recent decades. Anxiety disorders represent the largest subgroup of mental illness in all our countries. Indeed, the percentage of all mental illnesses that are anxiety disorders is itself significantly higher in more unequal countries. Unfortunately, there are no international sources of comparable data on the mental health of children and adolescents. Turning now to our other test bed, the 50 states of the USA, we discovered something rather surprising. Alone among the numerous health and social problems we examine in this book, we found no relationship between adult male mental illness and income inequality among the US states. State-specific estimates of mental illness are collected both by the United States Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance Study and by the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, but the lack of a relationship between income inequality and mental illness among men was consistent in both sources. However, income inequality is associated with mental illness in adult women. It is not a particularly strong relationship, but too strong to be dismissed as chance. There is also a similar relationship with the mental health of children. The National Survey of Children's Health provides estimates of the percentage of children in each state with moderate or severe difficulties in the area of emotions, concentration, behavior, or getting along with others. Although as for adult women, the relationship with state inequality is not particularly strong, children's mental health is significantly correlated with state levels of income inequality. There are several plausible explanations for the lack of an association between the available measures of adult mental health among men and inequality. In general, problems related to inequality have steep social gradients, becoming more common lower down the social ladder. Some indicators suggest that mental health in the USA does not show a consistent social gradient. Whether the explanation for this lies in methods of data collection, gender differences in reporting mental illness, the apparent resilience of ethnic minority populations to mental illness, see figure 5.2, or a delay in being able to observe the effects of growing inequality, it is important to remember that from an international perspective, levels of mental illness in the USA as a whole are exactly what we would expect given its high overall level of inequality. Clinging to the ladder. So why do more people tend to have mental health problems in more unequal places? Psychologist and journalist Oliver James uses an analogy with infectious disease to explain the link. The affluenza virus, according to James, is a set of values which increase our vulnerability to emotional distress, which he believes is more common in affluent societies. It entails placing a high value on acquiring money and possessions, looking good in the eyes of others, and wanting to be famous. These kinds of values place us at greater risk of depression, anxiety, substance abuse, and personality disorder, and are closely related to those we discussed in Chapter 3. 
In another recent book on the same subject, philosopher Alain de Botton describes status anxiety as a worry so pernicious as to be capable of ruining extended stretches of our lives. When we fail to maintain our position in the social hierarchy, we are condemned to consider the successful with bitterness and ourselves with shame. Economist Robert Frank observes the same phenomenon and calls it luxury fever. As inequality grows and the super-rich at the top spend more and more on luxury goods, the desire for such things cascades down the income scale and the rest of us struggle to compete and keep up. Advertisers play on this, making us dissatisfied with what we have and encouraging invidious social comparisons. Another economist, Richard Layard, describes our addiction to income. The more we have, the more we feel we need, and the more time we spend on striving for material wealth and possessions at the expense of our family life, relationships and quality of life. Given the importance of social relationships for mental health, it is not surprising that societies with low levels of trust and weaker community life are also those with worse mental health. Inequality and Illegal Drugs Low position in the social status hierarchy is painful to most people, so it comes as no surprise to find out that the use of illegal drugs, such as cocaine, marijuana and heroin, is more common in more unequal societies. Internationally, the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime publishes a World Drug Report, which contains separate data on the use of opiates, such as heroin, cocaine, cannabis, ecstasy and amphetamines. We combined these data to form a single index, giving each drug category the same weight so that the figures were not dominated by the use of any one drug. We use this index in figure 5.3, which shows a strong tendency for drug use to be more common in more unequal countries. Within the United States, there is also a tendency for addiction to illegal drugs and deaths from drug overdose to be higher in more unequal states. Monkey Business The importance of social status to our mental well-being is reflected in the chemical behaviour of our brains. Serotonin and dopamine are among the chemicals that play important roles in the regulation of mood. In humans, low levels of dopamine and serotonin have been linked to depression and other mental disorders. Although we must be cautious in extrapolating to humans, studies in animals show that low social status affects levels of and responses to different chemicals in the brain. In a clever experiment, researchers at Wake Forest School of Medicine in North Carolina took 20 macaque monkeys and housed them for a while in individual cages. They next housed the animals in groups of four and observed the social hierarchies which developed in each group, noting which animals were dominant and which subordinate. They scanned the monkeys' brains before and after they were put into groups. Next, they taught the monkeys that they could administer cocaine to themselves by pressing a lever. They could take as much or as little as they liked. The results of this experiment were remarkable. Monkeys that had become dominant had more dopamine activity in their brains than they had exhibited before becoming dominant, while monkeys that became subordinate when housed in groups showed no changes in their brain chemistry. The dominant monkeys took much less cocaine than the subordinate monkeys. In effect, the subordinate monkeys were medicating themselves against the impact of their low social status. This kind of experimental evidence in monkeys adds plausibility to our inference that inequality is causally related to mental illness. At the beginning of this chapter, we mentioned the huge number of prescriptions written for mood-altering drugs in the UK and USA. Add these to the self-medicating users of illegal drugs, and we see the pain wrought by inequality on a very large scale. 6. Physical Health and Life Expectancy Quote, A sad soul can kill you quicker than a germ, unquote. John Steinbeck travels with Charlie. Material and Psychosocial Determinants of Health As societies have become richer and our circumstances have changed, so the diseases we suffer from and the most important causes of health and illness have changed. 
The history of public health is one of shifting ideas about the causes of disease. In the 19th century, reformers began to collect statistics which showed the burden of ill health and premature death suffered by the poor living in city slums. This led to the great reforms of the sanitary movement, drainage and sewage systems, rubbish collection, public baths and decent housing, safer working conditions and improvements in food hygiene, all brought major improvements in population health and life expectancy lengthened as people's material standards of living advanced. As we described in Chapter 1, when infectious diseases lost their hold as the major causes of death, the industrialized world underwent a shift known as the epidemiological transition, and chronic diseases such as heart disease and cancer replaced infections as the major causes of death and poor health. During the greater part of the 20th century, the predominant approach to improving the health of populations was through lifestyle choices and risk factors to prevent these chronic conditions. Smoking, high-fat diets, exercise and alcohol were the focus of attention. But in the latter part of the 20th century, researchers began to make some surprising discoveries about the determinants of health. They had started to believe that stress was a cause of chronic disease, particularly heart disease. Heart disease was then thought of as the executive's disease, caused by the excess stress experienced by businessmen in responsible positions. The Whitehall 1 study, a long-term follow-up study of male civil servants, was set up in 1967 to investigate the causes of heart disease and other chronic illnesses. Researchers expected to find the highest risk of heart disease among men in the highest status jobs. Instead, they found a strong inverse association between position in the civil service hierarchy and death rates. Men in the lowest grade, messengers, doorkeepers, etc., had a death rate three times higher than that of men in the highest grade, administrators. Further studies in Whitehall 1 and a later study of civil servants Whitehall 2, which included women, have shown that low job status is not only related to a higher risk of heart disease, it is also related to some cancers, chronic lung disease, gastrointestinal disease, depression, suicide, sickness absence from work, back pain and self-reported health. So was it low status itself that was causing worse health? Or could these relationships be explained by differences in lifestyle between civil servants in different grades? Those in lower grades were indeed more likely to be obese, to smoke, to have higher blood pressure and to be less physically active. But these risk factors explained only one-third of their increased risk of deaths from heart disease. And of course, factors such as absolute poverty and unemployment cannot explain the findings because everybody in these studies was in paid employment. Of all the factors that the Whitehall researchers have studied over the years, job stress and people's sense of control over their work seem to make the most difference. There are now numerous studies that show the same thing in different societies and for most kinds of ill health, low social status has a clear impact on physical health and not just for people at the very bottom of the social hierarchy. As well as highlighting the importance of social status, this is the other important message from the Whitehall studies. There is a social gradient in health running right across society and where we are placed in relation to other people matters. Those above us have better health, those below us have worse health, from the very bottom to the very top. Understanding these health gradients means understanding why senior administrators live longer than those in professional and executive grades, as well as understanding the worse health profiles of the poor. Besides our sense of control over our lives, other factors which make a difference to our physical health include our happiness, whether we're optimistic or pessimistic, and whether we feel hostile or aggressive towards other people. Our psychological well-being has a direct impact on our health, and we're less likely to feel in control, happy, optimistic, etc., if our social status is low. It's not just our social status and psychological well-being that affects our health. The relationships we have with other people matter, too. 
This idea goes back as far as the work on suicide by Emil Durkheim, one of the founding fathers of sociology in the late 19th century. Durkheim showed that the suicide rates of different countries and populations were related to how well people were integrated into society and whether or not societies were undergoing rapid change and turmoil. But it wasn't until the 1970s that epidemiologists began to investigate systematically how people's social networks relate to health, showing that people with fewer friends were at higher risk of death. Having friends, being married, belonging to a religious group or other association, and having people who will provide support are all protective of health. Social support and social networks have also been linked both to the incidence of cardiovascular disease and to recovery from heart attacks. In a striking experiment, researchers have also shown that people with friends are less likely to catch a cold when given the same measured exposure to the cold virus. In fact, the more friends they had, the more resistant they were. Experiments have also shown that physical wounds heal faster if people have good relationships with their intimate partners. Social status and social integration are now well established as important determinants of population health, and increasingly researchers are also recognizing that stress in early life, in the womb as well as in infancy and early childhood, has an important influence on people's health throughout their lives. Stress in early life affects physical growth, emotional, social and cognitive development, as well as later health and health behaviours. And the socio-economic status of the families in which children live also determines their lifelong trajectories of health and development. Taken together, Social status, social networks, and stress in early childhood are what researchers label psychosocial factors, and these are of increasing importance in the rich, developed countries where material living standards, as we described in Chapter 1, are now high enough to have ceased to be important direct determinants of population health. This is the end of the CD. The audiobook continues on the next CD. Life is short where life is brutal. Evolutionary psychologists Margot Wilson and Martin Daly were interested in whether adopting more impulsive and risky strategies was an evolved response to more stressful circumstances in which life is likely to be shorter. In more threatening circumstances, then, more reckless strategies are perhaps necessary to gain status, maximize sexual opportunities, and enjoy at least some short-term gratifications. Perhaps only in more relaxed conditions, in which a longer life is assured, can people afford to plan for a long-term future. To test this hypothesis, they collected data on the murder rates for the 77 community areas of Chicago, and then they collected data on death rates for those same areas, subtracting all of the deaths caused by homicide. When they put the two together, they showed a remarkably close relationship, seen in figure 6.1. Neighborhoods with high homicide rates were also neighborhoods where people were dying younger from other causes as well. Something about these neighborhoods seemed to be affecting both health and violence. In Chapter 4, we showed how different developed countries and U.S. states vary in the levels of social trust that people feel. There are six-fold differences in levels of trust between developed countries and four-fold differences among U.S. states. We mentioned that levels of trust have been linked to population health, and in fact, research on social cohesion and social capital has mushroomed over the past ten years or so. More than 40 papers on the links between health and social capital have now been published. In the United States, epidemiologist Ichiro Kawachi and his colleagues at the Harvard School of Public Health looked at death rates in 39 states in which the general social surveys had been conducted in the late 1980s. These surveys allowed them to count how many people in each state were members of voluntary organizations, such as church groups and unions. This measure of group membership turned out to be a strong predictor of deaths from all causes combined, as well as deaths from coronary heart disease, cancers, and infant deaths. The higher the group membership, the lower the death rate. 
Robert Putnam looked at social capital in relation to an index of health and health care for the U.S. states. This index included information on such things as the percentage of babies born with low birth weight, the percentage of mothers receiving antenatal care, many different death rates, expenditure on health care, the number of people with AIDS and cancer, immunization rates, use of car safety belts, and numbers of hospital beds, among other factors. The health index was closely linked to social capital. States such as Minnesota and Vermont had high levels of social capital and scored high on the health index. States such as Louisiana and Nevada scored badly on both. Clearly, it's not just our individual social status that matters for health. The social connections between us matter, too. Health and Wealth Let's consider the health of two babies born into two different societies. Baby A is born in one of the richest countries in the world, the USA, home to more than half of the world's billionaires. It is a country that spends somewhere between 40 and 50 percent of the world's total spending on health care, although it contains less than 5 percent of the world's population. Spending on drug treatments and high-tech scanning equipment is particularly high. Doctors in this country earn almost twice as much as doctors elsewhere, and medical care is often described as the best in the world. Baby B is born in one of the poorer of the Western democracies, Greece where average income is not much more than half that of the USA. Whereas America spends more than $6,000 per person per year on health care, Greece spends less than $3,000. This is in real terms, after taking into account the different costs of medical care. And Greece has six times fewer high-tech scanners per person than the USA. Surely Baby B's chances of a long and healthy life are worse than Baby A's. In fact, Baby A, born in the USA, has a life expectancy of 1.2 years less than Baby B, born in Greece. And Baby A has a 40% higher risk of dying in the first year after birth than Baby B. Among developed countries, there are even bigger contrasts than the comparison we've used here, Babies born in the USA are twice as likely to die in their first year than babies in Japan, and the difference in average life expectancy between the USA and Sweden is three years. Between Portugal and Japan, it is over five years. Some comparisons are even more shocking. In 1990, Colin McCord and Harold Freeman in the Department of Surgery at Columbia University calculated that black men in Harlem were less likely to reach the age of 65 than men in Bangladesh. Among other things, our comparison between Baby A and Baby B shows that spending on health care and the availability of high-tech medical care are not related to population health. Figure 6.2 shows that in rich countries, there is no relationship between the amount of health spending per person and life expectancy. The Big Idea If average levels of income don't matter, and spending on high-tech healthcare doesn't matter, what does? There are now a large number of studies of income inequality and health that compare countries, American states, or other large regions, and the majority of these studies show that more egalitarian societies tend to be healthier. This vast literature was given impetus by a study by one of us on inequality and death rates published in the British Medical Journal in 1992. In 1996, the editors of that journal, commenting on further studies confirming the link between income inequality and health, wrote, Quote, the big idea is that what matters in determining mortality and health in a society is less the overall wealth of that society and more how evenly wealth is distributed. The more equally wealth is distributed, the better the health of that society. Unquote. Inequality is associated with lower life expectancy, higher rates of infant mortality, shorter height, poor self-reported health, low birth weight, AIDS, and depression. Figures 6.3 through 6.6 .6 show income inequality in relation to life expectancy for men and women and to infant mortality, first for the rich countries and then for the U.S. states. 
Of course, population averages hide the differences in health within any population, and these can be even more dramatic than the differences between countries. In the UK, health disparities have been a major item on the public health agenda for over 25 years, and the current National Health Service Plan states that no injustice is greater than the inequalities in health which scar our nation. In the late 1990s, the difference in life expectancy between the lowest and highest social class groups was 7.3 for men and 7 years for women. Studies in the USA often report even larger differences, such as a 28-year difference in life expectancy at age 16 between blacks and whites living in some of the poorest and some of the richest areas. To have many years less life because you're working class rather than professional, no one can argue about the serious injustice that these numbers represent. Note that, as the Whitehall study showed, these gaps cannot be explained away by worse health behaviours among those lower down the social scale. What then if the cost of that injustice is a three or four year shortening of average life expectancy if we live in a more unequal society? We examined several different causes of death to see which had the biggest class differences in health. We found that deaths among working age adults deaths from heart disease and deaths from homicide had the biggest class differences. In contrast, death rates from prostate cancer had small class differences and breast cancer death rates were completely unrelated to social class. Then we looked at how those different death rates were affected by income inequality and found that those with big class differences were much more sensitive to inequality. We also found that living in a more equal place benefited everybody, not just the poor. It's worth repeating that health disparities are not simply a contrast between the ill health of the poor and the better health of everybody else. Instead, they run right across society so that even the reasonably well-off have shorter lives than the very rich. Likewise, the benefits of greater equality spread right across society, improving health for everyone, not just those at the bottom. In other words, at almost any level of income, it's better to live in a more equal place. A dramatic example of how reductions in inequality can lead to rapid improvements in health is the experience of Britain during the two world wars. Increases in life expectancy for civilians during the war decades were twice those seen throughout the rest of the 20th century. In the decades which contain the world wars, life expectancy increased between six and seven years for men and women, whereas in the decades before, between and after, life expectancy increased by between one and four years. Although the nation's nutritional status improved with rationing in the Second World War, this was not true for the First World War, and material living standards declined during both wars. However, both wartimes were characterized by full employment and considerably narrower income differences, the result of deliberate government policies to promote cooperation with the war effort. During the Second World War, for example, working class incomes rose by 9%, while incomes of the middle class fell by 7%. Rates of relative poverty were halved. The resulting sense of camaraderie and social cohesion not only led to better health, crime rates also fell. Under our skin. So how do the stresses of adverse experiences in early life, of low social status and lack of social support, make us unwell? The belief that the mind affects the body has been around since ancient times, and modern research has enhanced our understanding of the ways in which stress increases the risk of ill health and pleasure and happiness promote well-being. The psyche affects the neural system and in turn the immune system. When we're stressed or depressed or feeling hostile, we are far more likely to develop a host of bodily ills, including heart disease, infections and more rapid aging. Stress disrupts our body's balance, interferes with what biologists call homeostasis, the state we're in when everything is running smoothly and all our physiological processes are normal. When we experience some kind of acute stress and experience something traumatic, our bodies go into the fight-or-flight response. 
energy stores are released, our blood vessels constrict, clotting factors are released into the bloodstream anticipating injury, and the heart and lungs work harder. Our senses and memory are enhanced, and our immune system perks up. We are primed and ready to fight or run away from whatever has caused the stress. If the emergency is over in a few minutes, this amazing response is healthy and protective. But when we go on worrying for weeks or months and stress becomes chronic, then our bodies are in a constant state of anticipation of some challenge or threat, and all those fight-or-flight responses become damaging. Chronic mobilization of energy in the form of glucose into the bloodstream can lead us to put on weight in the wrong places, central obesity, and even to diabetes. Chronic constriction of blood vessels and raised levels of blood clotting factors can lead to hypertension and heart disease. While acute momentary stress perks up our immune system, chronic continuing stress suppresses immunity and can lead to growth failure in children, ovulation failure in women, erectile dysfunction in men, and digestive problems for all of us. Neurons in some areas of the brain are damaged and cognitive function declines. We have trouble sleeping. Chronic stress wears us down and wears us out. In this chapter we've shown that there is a strong relationship between inequality and many different health outcomes, with a consistent picture in the USA and developed countries. Our belief that this is a causal relationship is enhanced by the coherent picture that emerges from research on the psychosocial determinants of health and the social gradients in health in developed countries. Position in society matters, for health and alternative explanations, such as higher rates of smoking among the poor, don't account for these gradients. There are now a number of studies showing that income inequality affects health, even after adjusting for people's individual incomes. The dramatic changes in income differences in Britain during the two world wars were followed by rapid improvements in life expectancy. Similarly, in Japan, the influence of the post-Second World War Allied occupation on demilitarization, democracy and redistribution of wealth and power led to an egalitarian economy and unrivaled improvements in population health. In contrast, Russia has experienced dramatic decreases in life expectancy since the early 1990s as it moved from a centrally planned to a market economy accompanied by a rapid rise in income inequality. The biology of chronic stress is a plausible pathway which helps us to understand why unequal societies are almost always unhealthy societies. 7. Obesity, Wider Income Gaps, Wider Wastes Quote, Food is the most primitive form of comfort, unquote, Sheila Graham. Obesity is increasing rapidly throughout the developed world. In some countries, rates have doubled in just a few years. Obesity is measured by Body Mass Index, BMI, to take height into account and avoid labeling people as overweight just because they are tall. Authors note, BMI equals weight in kilograms divided by height in meters squared. The World Health Organization has set standards for using BMI to classify people as underweight, BMI less than 18.5, normal weight, BMI 18.5 to 24.9, overweight, BMI 25 to 29.9, and obese, BMI greater than 30. In the USA in the late 1970s, close to half the population were overweight and 15% were obese. Now, three-quarters of the population are overweight and close to a third are obese. In the UK in 1980, about 40% of the population were overweight and less than 10% were obese. Now, two-thirds of adults are overweight and more than a fifth are obese. This is a major health crisis because obesity is so bad for health. It increases the risk of hypertension, type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, gallbladder disease, and some cancers. Trends in childhood obesity are now so serious that they are widely expected to lead to shorter life expectancies for today's children. 
That would be the first reversal in life expectancy in many developed countries since governments started keeping track in the 19th century. Apart from the health consequences, obesity reduces emotional and social well-being. Overweight and obese adults and children suffer terribly. A 17-year-old from Illinois weighing 409 pounds, 29 stone, described her physical pain. My heart aches in my chest and I have arm pains and stuff and it gets scary. But just as hurtful are the memories she has of other children calling her names at school, her restricted social life and her feeling that her body is almost a prison to me. Britain's tabloid newspaper The Sun featured three obese children in the spring of 2007. The youngest, a boy aged eight, weighed 218 pounds, 15.5 stone, and was being bullied at school when he attended. His weight was so great that he often missed school due to his difficulties in walking there and back, and was exempt from wearing school uniform because none was available to fit him. His eldest sister, aged nine, weighed 196 pounds, 14 stone, and was also being bullied and teased by both children and adults. She said she found it hard to breathe sometimes, and did not like having to wear ugly clothes and being unable to fit on the rides at amusement parks. Heaviest was the oldest boy, who at the age of 12 weighed 280 pounds, 20 stone. He was desperately unhappy, expelled from two schools and suspended from a third for lashing out at children who called him names. The Obesogenic Environment Many people believe that obesity is genetically determined, and genes do undoubtedly play a role in how susceptible different individuals are to becoming overweight. But the sudden rapid increase in obesity in many societies cannot be explained by genetic factors. The obesity epidemic is caused by changes in how we live. People often point to the changes in cost, ease of preparation and availability of energy-dense foods, to the spread of fast food restaurants, the development of the microwave, and the decline in cooking skills. Others point to the decline in physical activity, both at work and in leisure time, increasing car use, and the reduction in physical education programs in schools. Modern life, it seems, conspires to make us fat. If there was no more to it than that, then we might expect to see more obesity among richer people who are able to buy more food, more cars, etc., and high levels of obesity in all wealthy societies. But this is not what happens. During the epidemiological transition, which we discussed in chapters 1 and 6, in which chronic diseases replaced infectious diseases as the leading causes of death, obesity changed its social distribution. In the past, the rich were fat and the poor were thin, but in developed countries, these patterns are now reversed. The World Health Organization set up a study in the 1980s to monitor trends in cardiovascular diseases and the risk factors for these diseases, including obesity, in 26 countries. It found that as rates of obesity have increased, their social gradient has steepened. By the early 1990s, obesity was more common among poorer women compared to richer women in all 26 countries and among poorer men in all except five. As journalist Polly Toynbee declared in a newspaper article in 2004, fat is a class issue. Pointing to the high rates of obesity in the USA and the low rates among the Scandinavian countries, which prove that we don't find high levels of obesity in all modern rich societies, she suggested that income inequality might contribute to the obesity epidemic. Income inequality and obesity Figure 7.1 shows that levels of obesity tend to be lower in countries where income differences are smaller, the data on obesity come from the International Obesity Task Force and show the proportion of the adult population, both men and women, who are obese, a body mass index BMI of more than 30. The differences between countries are large. In the USA, just over 30% of adults are obese, 
a level more than 12 times higher than Japan, where only 2.4% of adults are obese. Because these figures are for BMI, not just weight, they're not due to differences in average height. The same pattern can be seen internationally for children, figure 7.2, our figures on the percentage of young people aged 13 and 15 who are overweight, reported in the 2007 UNICEF report on child well-being, came originally from the World Health Organization's Health Behaviour in School-Aged Children survey. There are no data for Australia, New Zealand or Japan from this survey, but the relationship with inequality is still strong enough to be sure it is not due to chance. The differences between countries are smaller for overweight children than for adult obesity. In the country with the lowest level, the Netherlands, 7.6% of children aged 13 and 15 are overweight, which is one-third the rate in the USA, where 25.1% are overweight. As these figures are based on children reporting their weight and height rather than being measured, the true prevalence of overweight is probably higher in all countries, but that shouldn't make much difference to how they are related to inequality. Within the USA, there are no states with levels of adult obesity lower than 20%. Colorado has the lowest obesity prevalence at 21.5%, compared to 34% in Texas, which has the highest. Authors note, the data on adult obesity within the USA were made available to us by Professor Majid Ezati from Harvard University School of Public Health. Professor Ezati bases his calculations of the prevalence of obesity in each state on actual measures of height and weight. But the relationship with inequality is still strong enough for us to be confident it isn't due to chance. Other researchers have found similar relationships, one study found that higher state income inequality was associated with abdominal weight gain in men. Others have found that income inequality increases the risk of inactive lifestyles. Overweight among the poor seems to be particularly strongly associated with income inequality. For children in the USA, we obtained data from the National Survey of Children's Health, figure 7.4, just as for the international figures for children, these data are for overweight, rather than obese, children aged 10 through 17 years. The child's height and weight are reported by the parent or the adult who knows the child best. The relationship with inequality is even stronger for children than for adults. Eating for comfort the pathways linking income inequality to obesity are likely to include calorie intake and physical activity. Indeed, our own research has shown that per capita calorie intake is higher in more unequal countries. This explained part of the relationship between inequality and obesity, but less for women than for men. Other researchers have shown that income inequality in U.S. states is related to physical inactivity. It seems that people in more unequal societies are eating more and exercising less. But in studies in Australia, the UK and Sweden, the amount that people eat and the amount of exercise they do fails to fully account for social class differences in weight gain and obesity. Calorie intake and exercise are only part of the story. People with a long history of stress seem to respond to food in different ways from people who are not stressed. Their bodies respond by depositing fat, particularly round the middle, in the abdomen, rather than lower down on hips and thighs. As we saw in Chapter 6, chronic stress affects the action of the hormone cortisol, and researchers have found differences in cortisol and psychological vulnerability to stress tests among men and women with high levels of abdominal fat. People who accumulate fat around the middle are at particularly high risk of obesity-associated illnesses. The body's stress reaction causes another problem. Not only does it make us put on weight in the worst places, it can also increase our food intake and change our food choices, a pattern known as stress eating or eating for comfort. In experiments with rats, when the animals are stressed, they eat more sugar and fat. People who are chronically stressed tend either to overeat and gain weight, or undereat and lose weight. In a study in Finland, 
people whose eating was driven by stress ate sausages, hamburgers, pizza and chocolate and drank more alcohol than other people. Scientists are starting to understand how comfort eating may be a way we cope with particular changes in our physiology when we are chronically stressed, changes that go with feelings of anxiety. The three obese children featured in the Sun newspaper whom we described earlier all seem to have turned to comfort eating to deal with family breakups. The nine-year-old girl said, Chocolate is the only thing I'm interested in. It's the only thing I live for. When I'm sad and worried, I just eat. Her older brother gained 210 pounds, 15 stone, in five years after his parents divorced. A number of years ago, the Wall Street Journal ran a series, Deadly Diet, on the nutrition problems of America's inner cities. Among the overweight people they interviewed was a 13-year-old girl living in a violent housing project, Estate, who said that food and TV were a way of calming her nerves. An unemployed woman who knew that her diet and drinking were damaging her liver and arteries still figured she might as well live high on the hog while she could. A grandmother bringing up her grandchildren because of her daughter's addiction to crack cocaine said, quote, Before I was so upset that my daughter was on this crack, I couldn't eat. I turned to Pepsi. It was like a drug for me. I couldn't function without it. I used to wake up with a Pepsi in my hand. A three-litre bottle would just see me through the day." Unquote. Recent research suggests that food stimulates the brains of chronic overeaters in just the same ways that drugs stimulate the brains of addicts. Studies using brain scans have shown that obese people respond both to food and to feeling full differently from thin people. Eating or not for status but food choices and diets aren't just dictated by the way we feel, they're also patterned by social factors. We make food choices for complicated cultural reasons. Sometimes we like foods we grew up eating, which represent home to us. Sometimes we want foods that represent a lifestyle we're trying to achieve. We offer food to other people to show that we love them, or to show that we're sophisticated, or that we can afford to be generous. Food has probably always played this role. It's the necessary component of the feast with all of its social meanings. But now, with the easy availability of cheap, energy-dense foods, whatever social benefits might come from frequent feasting, they are, so to speak, outweighed by the drawbacks. In the Wall Street Journal's Deadly Diet series, a recent immigrant from Puerto Rico describes how her family used to live on an unchanging diet of rice, beans, vegetables, pork, and dried fish. Since moving to Chicago, they have enjoyed fizzy drinks, pizza, hamburgers, sugared breakfast cereals, hot dogs, and ice cream. I can't afford to buy the children expensive shoes or dresses, but food is easier, so I let them eat whatever they want. Most of all, the family enjoy going to fast food restaurants and eat out twice a month, although the children would like to go more often. We feel good when we go to those places. We feel like we're Americans, that we're here and we belong here. A 17-year-old in New Jersey described how being able to buy fast food proves your financial status, shows that you have money in your pocket and are not having to wait for the welfare check at the end of the month. A 37-year-old man said he spent half his wages on fast food. On the day he was interviewed, he had been to McDonald's three times and was planning to go to Kentucky Fried Chicken and a Chinese takeout shop before the day was out. But the fast food restaurants had a meaning for him that went well beyond the cheap food. Despite working, he was homeless, and they had become his sanctuary. Quote, he has no home of his own and shuttles between his aunt's place in Brooklyn and a friend's apartment in a Harlem housing project, estate. The atmosphere makes me feel comfortable and relaxed and you don't have to rush, he says as he admires the hamburger restaurant's shiny floors and the picture of George Washington Carver, a famous 19th century black American on a wall. Lulled by the soft piped-in music, he nods off for a moment and then adds, Ain't no hip-hop, ain't no profanity. The picture, the plants, 
The way people keep things neat here, it makes you feel like you're in civilization. Unquote. A member of a Hispanic street gang eats all his meals at fast food restaurants, boasting that he hasn't eaten a meal at home since he was 16. Quote, Kids here don't want to eat their mother's food. Everyone is tired of their mother's food, rice and beans over and over. I wanted to live the life of a man. Fast food gets you status and respect. Fat is a feminine issue? Our own work, like the studies of other researchers, shows that the relation between income inequality and obesity is stronger for women than for men. In the World Health Organization study in 26 countries, the social gradient in obesity is seen more consistently and tends to be steeper for women than for men. In the 2003 Health Survey for England, the positive association between low socioeconomic status and obesity is very clear for women, but among men there is no association. It might be that these patterns result from obesity having a stronger negative effect on social mobility for women than for men. Maybe obese young women suffer more discrimination in labor markets and the marriage market than obese young men. Or maybe low social status is more of a risk factor for obesity in women than in men. Two studies within British birth cohorts offer some clues. These studies are surveys of large samples of people born at the same time and followed from birth. A study of people born in 1946 found that upwardly mobile men and women were less likely to be obese than those whose social class didn't change between childhood and adulthood. In the 1970 cohort, obese women but not men were more likely never to have had gainful employment and not to have a partner. In the USA and in Britain, female obesity in adolescence has been linked to lower earnings in adulthood. Although not limited to women, a recent survey of more than 2,000 human resource professionals found that 93% would favor a normal weight job applicant over an equally qualified overweight candidate. Nearly 50% of these professionals felt that overweight people were less productive. Almost 33% felt that obesity was a valid reason not to hire somebody. And 40% felt that overweight people lacked self-discipline. Although being overweight clearly hampers social mobility, our own analysis of trends within women born in Britain in 1970 suggests that this doesn't explain the social gradient in obesity among women, and even in middle age, low social class is linked to weight gain. You can never be too rich or too thin. Social class differences in the importance of body size and in the body image towards which women aspire also seem to contribute to the social gradient in obesity. In the past, women with voluptuous bodies were much admired, but in many modern, richer cultures, being thin signals high social class and attractiveness. British women in higher social classes are more likely to monitor their weight and to be dieting than women in lower social class groups, and are also more dissatisfied with their bodies. Women who move down the social scale seem to place less emphasis on thinness and are more satisfied with their bodies. Changes in marital status also play a role. In a US study, Women who married gained more weight than women who remained single, or women who divorced or separated. And not all women want to be thin. For example, in inner-city African-American communities, thinness can be associated with an image of poverty, hunger and being on welfare, as well as AIDS and drug addiction. As one 19-year-old woman put it, quote, I've been a voluptuous female all my life. If I start losing a lot of weight, people will think I'm on drugs. In the ghetto, you just can't afford to look too thin." Unquote. Her words are a reminder of the ways in which social class is related to being overweight in the developing world, where only the affluent can afford to be fat. In wealthy countries, it looks as if women in higher social classes are more likely to have aspirations to thinness and be more able to achieve them. But while women's body weight may be most affected by social factors, men are certainly not immune. 
A recent 12-year study of working-age men in the USA found that if they became unemployed, they gained weight. When their annual income dropped, they gained on average 5.5 pounds. The Thrifty Phenotype One additional idea that suggests a causal link between higher levels of income inequality in a society and higher body weights is known as the Thrifty Phenotype Hypothesis. Put simply, this theory suggests that when a pregnant woman is stressed, the development of her unborn child is modified to prepare it for life in a stressful environment. It isn't yet clear whether stress hormones themselves do the damage, or whether stressed fetuses are less well nourished, or both things happen, but these thrifty phenotype babies have a lower birth weight and a lower metabolic rate. In other words, they are adapted for an environment where food is scarce, they are small and need less food. In conditions of scarcity during our evolutionary past, this adaptation would have been beneficial, but in our modern world, where stress during pregnancy is unlikely to be due to food shortages and babies are born into a world of plenty, it's maladaptive. Babies with a thrifty phenotype in a world where food is plentiful are more prone to obesity, to diabetes, and to cardiovascular disease. As this book shows, societies with higher levels of income inequality have higher levels of mistrust, illness, status insecurity, violence, and other stressors, so the thrifty phenotype may well be contributing to the high prevalence of obesity in them. The Equality Diet It is clear that obesity and overweight are not problems confined to the poor. In the USA, about 12% of the population are poor, but more than 75% are overweight. In the UK, social class differences in women's obesity can be seen all the way up the social ladder. While obesity affects only 16% of higher managerial and professional women, just below them, 20% of lower managerial and professional women are obese. It's hard to argue in the face of these facts that the obesity epidemic is due to poor nutritional knowledge among the uneducated. In a study of middle-aged British women, 84% knew they should be eating five fruits and vegetables each day, and another study showed that obese people are better than thinner people at guessing the calorie content of snack foods. Another piece of evidence that it's relative, not absolute, levels of income that matter for obesity comes from studies in which people are asked to describe subjectively their place in the social hierarchy. Researchers show subjects a diagram of a ladder and tell them that at the top are people with the highest status and at the bottom people with the lowest status, and then ask them to place an X on the ladder to mark their own standing. It has been shown that this measure of subjective social status is linked to an unhealthy pattern of fat distribution and to obesity. In other words, obesity was more strongly related to people's subjective sense of their status than to their actual education or income. If we can observe that changes in societal income inequality are followed by changes in obesity, this would also be supportive evidence for a causal association. An example of a society that has experienced a rapid increase in inequality is post-reunification Germany. After the fall of the Berlin Wall, inequality increased in the former East Germany, and there is evidence from studies following people over time that this social disruption led to increases in the body mass index of children, young adults and mothers. Health and social policies for obesity treatment and prevention tend to focus on the individual. These policies try to educate people about the risks associated with being overweight and try to coach them into better habits. But these approaches overlook the reasons why people continue to live a sedentary lifestyle and eat an unhealthy diet, how these behaviours give comfort or status, why there is a social gradient in obesity, how depression and stress in pregnancy play a role. Because behaviour changes are easier for people who feel in control and in a good emotional state, lessening the burdens of inequality could make an important contribution towards resolving the epidemic of obesity. 8. Educational Performance Quote, 
Our progress as a nation can be no swifter than our progress in education. The human mind is our fundamental resource, unquote. John F. Kennedy, Special Message to the Congress on Education, 20th of February, 1961. Across the developed world, and across the political spectrum, everybody agrees about the importance of education. It's good for society, which needs the contributions and economic productivity, not to mention the tax of a skilled workforce, and it's good for individuals. People with more education earn more, are more satisfied with their work and leisure time, are less likely to be unemployed, more likely to be healthy, less likely to be criminals, more likely to volunteer their time and vote in elections. In 2006, according to the U.S. Department of Labor, if you had been to high school but didn't graduate with a diploma, you earned an average of $419 per week. That sum rose to $595 if you had the diploma, up to $1,039 if you'd gone to college and got a bachelor's degree, and rose to over $1,200 for an advanced degree. The Home Advantage Although good schools make a difference, the biggest influence on educational attainment, how well a child performs in school and later in higher education, is family background. In a report on the future of education in Britain, Melissa Benn and Fiona Miller describe how quote, One of the biggest problems facing British schools is the gap between rich and poor, and the enormous disparity in children's home backgrounds and the social and cultural capital they bring to the education table." Unquote. Children do better if their parents have higher incomes and more education themselves, and they do better if they come from homes where they have a place to study, where there are reference books and newspapers, and where education is valued. Parental involvement in children's education is even more important. So why, when all developed societies are committed to education and equality of opportunity, at least in theory, do disadvantaged children do less well at school and miss out on the myriad benefits of education, however good the school system? As we shall see, some societies come a lot closer to achieving equality of opportunity than others. Unequal Attainment Figure 8.1 shows that international education scores are closely related to income inequality, and Figure 8.2 shows the same relationship for the USA. More unequal countries and more unequal states have worse educational attainment, and these relationships are strong enough for us to be sure that they are not due to chance. Comparable international data on education achievement come from the Programme for International Student Assessment, PISA, which was set up to administer standardized tests to 15-year-olds in schools in different countries. The program began in 43 countries in 2000 and assesses children every three years, typically testing between 4,500 and 10,000 children in each country each time. Schools are randomly selected. PISA tests 15-year-olds because they are coming to the end of compulsory education in most countries. Each survey gives tests in reading, mathematical and scientific literacy. The goal is to test how well children can apply knowledge and skills. For consistency with the data available for the US, we combine national average scores for reading and maths only and plot them against income inequality, figure 8.1. However, if scientific literacy scores are added in, it makes little difference to the results. No data were available for the UK from PISA 2003, as too few schools agreed to take part in the survey to meet the PISA standards. The same strong international relationship with income inequality has been shown for adult literacy scores as well, using data from the International Adult Literacy Survey. To examine the same relationship among the 50 states of the USA, we combined maths and reading performance scores for 8th graders, aged around 14 years old, from the US Department of Education, National Center for Education Statistics for 2003, figure 8.2. The scores are significantly lower in states with wider income differences. As a further test, we looked at the proportion of children dropping out of high school in the USA. 
As figure 8.3 shows, children are much more likely to drop out of school in more unequal states. The states with the lowest dropout rates are Alaska, Wyoming, Utah, Minnesota, and New Hampshire, with dropout rates around 12 percent. In three states, Mississippi, Louisiana, and Kentucky, more than a quarter of children drop out of high school with no educational qualifications. You might think that this striking association is due to absolute poverty, that kids drop out of high school more frequently in poor states so that they can start earning sooner and contribute to the family budget. And it is true that high school dropout rates are higher in poor states, but poverty and inequality have independent effects. Poverty does not explain the inequality effect. No state has a poverty rate higher than 17 percent, but dropout rates are above 20 percent in 16 states, and dropping out is not confined to the poor. Standards of performance It is often assumed that the desire to raise national standards of performance in fields such as education is quite separate from the desire to reduce educational inequalities within a society. But the truth may be almost the opposite of this. It looks as if the achievement of higher national standards of education performance may actually depend on reducing the social gradient in educational achievement in each country. Douglas Wilms, professor of education at the University of New Brunswick, Canada, has provided striking illustrations of this. In Figure 8.4, we show the relation between adult literacy scores from the International Adult Literacy Survey and their parents' level of education in Finland, Belgium, the UK, and the USA. This figure suggests that even if your parents are well-educated, and so presumably of high social status, the country you live in makes some difference to your educational success. But for those lower down the social scale with less well-educated parents, it makes a very much larger difference. An important point to note looking at these four countries is the steepness of the social gradient, steepest in the USA and the UK where inequality is high, flatter in Finland and Belgium which are more equal. It is also clear that an important influence on the average literacy scores on national levels of achievement in each of these countries is the steepness of the social gradient. The USA and UK will have low average scores pulled down across the social gradient. Wilms has demonstrated that the pattern we've shown in figure 8.4 holds more widely internationally among 12 developed countries as well as among Canadian provinces and the states of the USA. As well as the tendency towards divergence, larger differences at the bottom of the social gradient than at the top, he says, there is a strong inverse relationship between average proficiency levels and the slope of the socioeconomic gradients. Epidemiologist Arjuman Siddiqui and colleagues have also looked at social gradients in reading literacy in 15-year-olds using data from PISA 2000. They found that countries with a long history of welfare state provision did better and, like Wilms, report that countries with higher average scores have smaller social differences in reading literacy. Finland and Sweden have high average reading scores and low levels of inequality in reading scores. Greece and Portugal have low average scores and a high degree of inequality in reading literacy. Siddiqui and colleagues do, however, note some exceptions to this general pattern. New Zealand and the UK have high average reading scores, but a high degree of social inequality in reading literacy. On the other hand, Norway combines a rather mediocre average score with very little socio-economic inequality in reading literacy. One explanation offered by these researchers is that New Zealand and the UK have a greater proportion of children who should sit the tests but do not, because they have dropped out or are truants. Educational welfare Siddiqui and colleagues emphasize that high reading scores and low social inequalities in reading literacy are found in nations marked by stronger welfare provisions. This is a point we will return to in Chapter 12 when we look at public spending on education in relation to income inequality. But how else might income inequality affect educational outcomes? One important connection is likely to be through the impact of inequality on the quality of family life and relationships. 
social inequalities in early childhood development are entrenched long before the start of formal education. We know a lot now about the importance of the early years for later development. Learning begins at birth, and the first few years of life are a critical period for brain development. This early learning can be enhanced or inhibited by the environment in which a child grows up. A nationwide study in the UK found that by the age of three years, children from disadvantaged backgrounds were already educationally up to a year behind children from more privileged homes. Essential for early learning is a stimulating social environment. Babies and young children need to be in caring, responsive environments. They need to be talked to, loved and interacted with. They need opportunities to play, talk and explore their world, and they need to be encouraged within safe limits rather than restricted in their activities or punished. All of these things are harder for parents and other caregivers to provide when they are poor or stressed or unsupported. In Chapter 4, we described how the general quality of social relationships is lower in more unequal societies, and in Chapters 5 and 6, we showed how inequality is linked to poor physical and mental health and more substance abuse. It's not a great leap, then, to think how life in a more hierarchical, mistrustful society might affect intimate domestic relationships and family life. Domestic conflict and violence, parental mental illness, poverty of time and resources will all combine to affect child development. The results of these stresses can perhaps be seen in an analysis by economists Robert Frank and Adam Levine of Cornell University. They showed that in the United States, counties that had the largest increases in income inequality were the same counties that experienced the largest rises in divorce rates. Children living in low-income families experience more family conflict and disruption and are more likely to witness or experience violence, as well as to be living in more crowded, noisy and substandard housing. The quality of the home environment is directly related to income. The way parents behave in response to relative poverty mediates its impact on children. There is evidence that some families are resilient to such problems, while others react with more punitive and unresponsive parenting, even to the extent of becoming neglectful or abusive. It is important, once again, to note that difficulties in family relationships and parenting are not confined to the poor. Sociologist Annette Larrault describes how parenting differs between middle-class, working-class and poor families in America. There are key differences in the organization of daily life, the use of language, and the degree to which families are socially connected. We have found that within the UK Millennium Cohort Study, a large survey of children born in 2000 and 2001, even mothers in the second from the top social class group are more likely to report feeling incompetent as a parent or having a poor relationship with their children compared to those in the topmost group. Societies can do a lot to ameliorate the stresses on families and to support early childhood development. From the very start of life, some societies do more than others to promote a secure attachment between mother and infant through the provision of paid maternity leave for mothers who work. Using data on the duration of paid maternity leave provided by the Clearing House on International Developments in Child, Youth and Family Policies at Columbia University, we found that more equal countries provided longer periods of paid maternity leave. Sweden provides parental leave, which can be divided between mothers and fathers, with 80% wage replacement until the child is 18 months old. A further three months can be taken at a flat rate of pay, and then another three months of unpaid leave on top of that. Norway gives parents, again either mother or father, a year of leave at 80% wage replacement, or 42 weeks at 100%. In contrast, the USA and Australia provide no statutory entitlement to paid leave. In Australia, parents can have a year of unpaid leave, in the USA, 12 weeks. As well as allowing parental leave, societies can improve the quality of early childhood through the provision of family allowances and tax benefits, social housing, health care, programs to promote work-life balance, enforcing child support payments, and perhaps most importantly, through the provision of high-quality early childhood education. 
Early childhood education programs can foster physical and cognitive development as well as social and emotional development. They can alter the long-term trajectories of children's lives and cost-benefit analyses show that they are high-yield investments. In experiments, disadvantaged children who have received high-quality early childhood education are less likely to need remedial education, less likely to become involved in crime, and they earn more as adults. All of this adds up to a substantial return on government investments in such programs. Unequal learning opportunities so far, we have described ways in which greater inequality may affect children's development through its impact on family life and relationships. But there is also evidence of more direct effects of inequality on children's cognitive abilities and learning. In 2004, World Bank economists Carla Hoff and Priyanka Pandey reported the results of a remarkable experiment. They took 321 high-caste and 321 low-caste 11- to 12-year-old boys from scattered rural villages in India and set them the task of solving mazes. First, the boys did the puzzles without being aware of each other's caste. Under this condition, the low-caste boys did just as well with the mazes as the high-caste boys, indeed, slightly better. Then the experiment was repeated but this time each boy was asked to confirm an announcement of his name, village, father's and grandfather's names, and caste. After this public announcement of caste, the boys did more mazes, and this time there was a large caste gap in how well they did. The performance of the low-caste boys dropped significantly, figure 8.5. This is striking evidence that performance and behaviour in an educational task can be profoundly affected by the way we feel we are seen and judged by others. When we expect to be viewed as inferior, our abilities seem to be diminished. The same phenomenon has been demonstrated in experiments with white and black high school students in America, most convincingly by social psychologists Claude Steele at Stanford University and Joshua Aronson at New York University. In one study, they administered a standardized test used for college students' admission to graduate programs. In one condition, the students were told that the test was a measure of ability. In a second condition, the students were told that the test was not a measure of ability. The white students performed equally under both conditions, but the black students performed much worse when they thought their ability was being judged. Steele and Aronson labeled this effect stereotype threat, and it's now been shown that it is a general effect which applies to sex differences as well as racial and ethnic differences. Despite the work we mentioned on social anxiety and the effects of being judged negatively which we discussed in Chapter 3, it is perhaps surprising how easily stereotypes and stereotype threats are established, even in artificial conditions. Jane Elliott, an American schoolteacher, conducted an experiment with her students in 1968 in an effort to teach them about racial inequality and injustice. She told them that scientists had shown that people with blue eyes were more intelligent and more likely to succeed than people with brown eyes, who were lazy and stupid. She divided her class into blue-eyed and brown-eyed groups and gave the blue-eyed group extra privileges, praise and attention. The blue-eyed group quickly asserted its superiority over the brown-eyed children, treating them contemptuously, and their school performance improved. The brown-eyed group just as quickly adopted a submissive timidity, and their marks declined. After a few days, Elliot told the children she had got the information mixed up, and that actually it was brown eyes that indicated superiority. The classroom situation rapidly reversed. New developments in neurology provide biological explanations for how our learning is affected by our feelings. We learn best in stimulating environments when we feel sure we can succeed. When we feel happy or confident, our brains benefit from the release of dopamine, the reward chemical, which also helps with memory, attention and problem solving. We also benefit from serotonin, which improves mood, and from adrenaline, which helps us to perform at our best. When we feel threatened, helpless and stressed, our bodies are flooded by the hormone cortisol, which inhibits our thinking and memory. 
So inequalities of the kind we have been describing in this chapter, in society and in our schools, have a direct and demonstrable effect on our brains, on our learning and educational achievement. Different strokes for different folks. Another way in which inequality directly affects educational achievement is through its impact on the aspirations, norms and values of people who find themselves lower down the social hierarchy. While education is viewed by the middle class and by teachers and policy makers as the way upwards and outwards for the poor and working class, these values are not always subscribed to by the poor and working class themselves. In her 2006 book Educational Failure and Working Class White Children in Britain, anthropologist Gillian Evans describes the working class culture of Bermondsey in East London. She shows how the kinds of activities expected of children in schools fit with the way middle class parents expect their children to play and interact at home, but clash with the way in which working class families care for and interact with their children. To a degree, Working-class people resist the imposition of education and middle-class values because becoming educated would require them to give up ways of being that they value. One woman tells Evans that being common means knowing how to have a good laugh because you're not stuck up. The things that the women she describes like to talk about are their families, their health, work and ways to get money, housework, relationships, shopping, sex and gossip. Talking about abstract ideas, books and culture is seen as posh and pretentious. The children of these working-class mothers are constrained by minimal rules in their homes. Evans describes children who are allowed to eat and drink what they like when they like, to smoke at home, to do homework or not as they please. If they want to learn, they will. If they don't, they won't. And that's that. Of course, these families want the best for their children, but that best isn't always education, education, education. That poor and working-class children resist formal education and middle-class values does not, of course, mean that they have no aspirations or ambitions. In fact, when we first looked at data on children's aspirations from a UNICEF report on childhood well-being, we were surprised at its relationship to income inequality, figure 8.6. More children reported low aspirations in more equal countries. In unequal countries, children were more likely to have high aspirations. Some of this may be accounted for by the fact that in more equal societies, less skilled work may be less stigmatized in comparison to more unequal societies where career choices are dominated by rather starstruck ideas of financial success and images of glamour and celebrity. In more unequal countries, we found a larger gap between aspirations and actual opportunities and expectations. If we compare figure 8.1 on maths and reading scores in different countries to figure 8.6, it is clear that aspirations are higher in countries where educational achievement is lower. More children might be aspiring to higher status jobs, but fewer of them will be qualified to get them. If inequality leads to unrealistic hopes, it must also lead to disappointment. Gillian Evans quotes a teacher at an inner-city primary school who summed up the corrosive effect of inequality on children. Quote, These kids don't know their working class. They won't know that until they leave school and realize that the dreams they've nurtured through childhood can't come true. Unquote. In the next two chapters, we'll show how young women and young men in more unequal societies respond to their low social status, and in Chapter 12, we'll return to the theme of education and life chances when we examine the impact of inequality on social mobility. 9. Teenage Births – Recycling Deprivation Quote, just saying no prevents teenage pregnancy the way have a nice day cures chronic depression, unquote. Faye Wattleton, Conference Speech, Seattle, 1988. In the summer of 2005, three sisters hit the headlines of Britain's tabloid newspapers. All three were teenage mothers. The youngest was the first of the girls to become pregnant and had her baby at the age of 12. We were in bed at my mum's house messing around and sex just sort of happened, she said. 
I didn't tell anyone, because I was too scared and didn't know what to do. I wish it had happened to someone else. Soon after, the next older sister had a baby at age fourteen. It was just one of those things. I thought it would never happen to me, she said. At first I wanted an abortion, because I didn't want to be like my sister, but I couldn't go through with it. The oldest sister, the last of the girls to find out she was pregnant, gave birth aged sixteen. Unlike her sisters, she seemed to welcome motherhood. I left school, as I wasn't really interested, she admitted. All my friends were having babies, and I wanted to be a mum too. At the time their stories became news, the girls were all living at home with their mother, sharing their bedrooms with their babies, the youngest two struggling with school, and all three trying to get by on social security benefits. With no qualifications and no support from the fathers of their babies, their futures were bleak. Media commentators and members of the public were quick to condemn the sisters and their mother, portraying them as feckless scroungers. Meet the kid sisters, benefit Bonanza. Girls' babies are the real victims, exclaimed the newspapers. Their mother blamed the lack of sex education in school. Why it matters the press furor brings society's fears and concerns around teenage motherhood into sharp focus. Often described as babies having babies, teenage motherhood is seen as bad for the mother, bad for the baby, and bad for society. There is no doubt that babies born to teenage mothers are more likely to have low birth weight, to be born prematurely, to be at higher risk of dying in infancy, and, as they grow up, to be at greater risk of educational failure, juvenile crime, and becoming teenage parents themselves. Girls who give birth as teenagers are more likely to be poor and uneducated. But are all the bad things associated with teenage birth really caused by the age of the mother? Or are they simply a result of the cultural world in which teenage mothers give birth? This issue is hotly debated. On the one hand, some argue that teenage motherhood is not a health problem because young age is not in itself a cause of worse outcomes. In fact, among poor African Americans, cumulative exposure to poverty and stress across their lifetimes compromises their health to such an extent that their babies do better if these women have their children at a young age. This idea is known as weathering and suggests that for poor and disadvantaged women, postponing pregnancy until later ages doesn't actually mean that they have healthier babies. Others have shown that the children of teenage mothers are more likely to end up excluded from mainstream society with worse physical and emotional health and more deprivation. This is true even after taking account of other childhood circumstances, such as social class, education, whether the parents were married or not, the parents' personalities, and so on. But although we can sometimes separate out the influences of maternal age and economic circumstances in research studies, in real life they often seem inextricably intertwined, and teenage motherhood is associated with an intergenerational cycle of deprivation. But how exactly are young women's individual experiences and choices, their personal choices about sleeping with their boyfriends, choices around contraception and abortion, choices about qualifications and careers, shaped by the society they live in? Like the issues discussed in earlier chapters, the teenage birth rate is strongly related to relative deprivation and to inequality. This is the end of the CD. The audiobook continues on the next CD.